welcome everybody to the session where we would solve a lot of NVMe questions. Basically, a lot of questions which are really high yield and I would try tie in with high yield pictures as well as notes so that it would be helpful to all those people who are working really hard towards their dreams and goals. Uh, I would cover a lot of books, a lot of pictures, random pictures from Google, from different slide share options, from YouTube, uh, my personal notes, many, many books like the Thoma, Davidson, uh, First Aid, a lot of books. So, yeah, I hope this comes off some use to everybody. Okay, so let's start. Uh, none of the resources I have used over here, like this NVMe version, this offline version, uh, whatever you see out here, like the first day, Davidson, uh, none of the things are my own creation. It's like all there in these books. What I would do is like I would merge this stuff and I would use my personal knowledge to uh, help all those people uh, who are still struggling with the uh, right answers and uh, a right guideline. Okay, let's get started. Uh, a 65 year old woman has the recent appearance of a lesion at the side of a peripheral scar on the lung. The scar developed at the site of a pulmonary infarct 20 years ago. It was not present on her last x-ray two years ago. She has not smoked cigarettes for the past 20 years. A lobectomy is done. Which of the following is the most likely type of malignancy? So whenever you get this kind of questions, you would have to see like very specific buzzwords. One buzzword here is like a peripheral scar. Now, wherever we see a scar, uh, a lot of differential diagnosis comes into our mind. Uh, now we need to locate the, the scars. I mean, is it central or peripheral? If it's central, we know there are limited opportunities. Like it can be either like central, which means small cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, or it can be some kind of other uh, kind of malignancies which are arising from that suppose pleural structure, as well as uh, like for central, the squamous cell would be from the bronchial structures, the airways. And in case of the peripheral scars, the most important one is adenocarcinoma of the lung. So taking this one into consideration, there is uh, no smoking history. It's a woman, it's a peripheral scar in the lung, plus there has been a history of pulmonary infarct 20 years ago. This most likely fits out here, adenocarcinoma. It was pretty much of an easy question. If you knew it, you would move on to the next question. That's how easy it was. But anyway, we need to know about the other ones as well. Let's suppose malignant lymphoma, metastatic carcinoma, small cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. So let's dive into first aid for a bit and we can find out there like in the respiratory section if you see there there are a lot of things in the respiratory section very nitty gritty details we don't pay hit into but everything is important in this golden book I would say first aid everything is important every word is important here anyway let's look into it you can see like the Small cell carcinoma, it would be associated with paraneoplastic syndromes like Cushing syndrome with SIADH antibodies against the presynaptic calcium channels. And there would be this another one, this is called paraneoplastic myelitis, encephalitis, or subacute cerebellar degeneration. Now, you wouldn't see that much of questions related to the myelitis or encephalitis. 
But subacute cerebral degeneration, I have seen questions like from in the U world or in random NBMEs, you would find this kind of questions. Uh, another thing is like uh, adenocarcinoma, which is like a non-small cell variant. See, like it's divided into two parts basically, lung cancers, small cell and non-small cell. So whatever is non-small cell is like adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, large cell or bronchial carcinoid. Now adenocarcinoma is peripheral in location. It's the most common primary lung cancer, more common in women than men, most likely to arise in non-smokers, activating mutations in the KRAS, EGFR and ALK. Uh, above this ALK, you might have noticed a question was there in the U world, it was like EML4 ALK translocation. So this is another example of translocation and uh, basically they would uh, activate a tyrosine kinase and here like a tyrosine kinase inhibitor in this case would be perfect for the treatment purpose. Uh, there is a subtype, bronchioalveolar subtype which is known as adenocarcinoma in situ. Chest x-ray will show hazy infiltrates which is similar to pneumonia and it has a better prognosis definitely. Uh, I mean in comparison with these things, it has a better prognosis. Squamous cell carcinoma, as long if you if you are already into NBMEs and have done first aid and everything, this is a pretty easy thing. It's central and it's like a hilar mass. It arises from the bronchus. It, it has cavitations. It is associated with cigarette smoking and hypercalcemia, which is like a panneoplastic syndrome here. Uh, in any squamous cell carcinoma, you would find these things, keratin pearls or intercellular bridges. Now, keratin pearls would be seen basically in mild dysplasia. In case of a moderate dysplasia, you will see like this intercellular bridges. And there is this thing called samoma bodies. You would find the samoma bodies in case of severe dysplasia. Large cell carcinoma, its location is uh, peripheral in nature and it is highly anaplastic undifferentiated tumor. Uh, with adenocarcinoma you need to remember one thing. You can see it here basically. See if it's if it if this is the slide they have given for adenocarcinoma, it stains mucin positive. See like all this white matter you see inside I mean uh, encircling the nuclei. This thing is basically mucin. So you would find this thing called mucin positivity. It's glandular in pattern. Now, let's suppose uh, if we have like this thing called small cell carcinoma, you will see like small blue cells. This is pretty easy. There's the samama bodies. You can see, oh, sorry, no, not samama bodies. It is keratin pearls. And here you can see like it's pleomorphic giant cell. So you will find giant cells in case of large cell carcinoma. Bronchial carcinoid tumor, it's either central or peripheral. Uh, it has excellent prognosis. It is associated with chromogramin A, neuroendocrine cells, or it is even associated with synaptophysin, bombesin, enolase, this kind of things. Symptoms would be due to the mass effect or carcinoid syndrome, which would be associated with flushing, diarrhea, and wheezing. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, an otherwise healthy 82 year old man is brought to the physician by his wife because of a six month history of progressive numbness and tingling in his toes bilaterally. His wife says that he also has had mildly increased short term memory difficulties during this period. He has not been examined by a physician for past three years. His vital signs are within normal limits. Physical examination shows normal muscle mass and tone. Muscle strength is 5 by 5 in the lower extremities. Patellar and Achilles deep tendon reflexes are normal. Sensation to pin prick is decreased in the lower extremities below the level of the knees. He walks with a wide based gait. Laboratory studies show a hemoglobin concentration of 9 grams per deciliter. Hematocrit of 28% and platelet count of 175,000. 
A photomicrograph is shown here. What is the diagnosis they are asking? Now, if you look carefully into this photo, you can see it clearly from here, like. Okay, like in this photo, what are we seeing here? See, this one, this thing doesn't stain pink, like the cytoplasm. It doesn't look that granular. It is granular, definitely, but it doesn't look that granular. Uh, it doesn't look basophilic or blue, the cytoplasm. Like the lobes, how many lobes are there? There, I can see like seven lobes. We know like more than six lobes, or even six lobes. It is like... Uh, it is like a feature which is found in the neutrophils when there is uh, some kind of hypersegmented neutrophil. It can be associated with a number of causes, but like vitamin B12 formation, if it's somehow affected, you can get this kind of thing. And the patient is anemic as well. So in that case, we can presumably think like okay this is like a posterior cord defect because other things none of them like fits there so i have some notes here we can read through it posterior cord syndrome occurs due to infarction of the posterior half of the spinal cord from occlusion of the posterior spinal artery our patient presents with decreased sensation to pinprick below the level of the knees as well as walking with a wide based gait likely indicating loss of proprioception. The patient is also anemic with hypersegmented neutrophils. Hypersegmented neutrophils are typically caused by an inability to make enough DNA, caused by a lack of necessary precursors and vitamins including B9, B12. If the patient is fully deficient, we will see like elevated homocysteine, which we are not seeing here. If the patient is B12 deficient, we will see methylmalonic aciduria, I mean, the methylmalonic acid levels would be high, which is not even present here. Hyperhomocysteinemia would be there, and it can cause thrombosis. And basically, what we are seeing, like they haven't given us the B12 levels, but we need to find out, like why would, um, I mean, why would it happen, like this kind of posterior cord syndrome, like? Because it's supplied by like a specific artery, like the posterior spinal artery. Now, if we occlude it for any reason, whatever the reason may be, there can be embolus, there can be thrombosis, there can be anything. Hypothetically speaking, anything can happen. Now, here, like the notes are saying, like hyperhomocysteinemia, it causes thrombosis, and from this thrombosis, we can have like this kind of. Uh, occlusion of the arterial supply and that would uh, impair or compromise the blood flow there that would lead to this posterior cord syndrome where we would see like this decreased pain prick sensation corticospinal tract and dorsal column medial laminescal tract would be involved here in this case now there can be one thing that would uh, that might like give us a little bit of uh, confusion in this question where they are talking about uh, we know like in vitamin B12 deficiency it causes generally uh, subacute combined degeneration so in subacute combined degeneration if you remember we have seen it in first eight wrong section a lot of parts okay yeah in this page like see page 518 in 2019 version you would see like in case of uh, posterior cord syndrome 
You would see like see like the entire dorsal lemniscus is gone, dorsal column is gone, as well as the corticospinal tracts are gone. And there is demyelination of the spinocerebellar tracts, lateral corticospinal tracts and dorsal column. So from that from that perspective we can say like I mean it should be like From that perspective, you, you should say, we should think like, okay, this can be posterior cord syndrome, but there is no uh, spasticity on the contralateral side, as well as you can see like other ones, none of them basically fit here. Anterior cord, we have seen it here. The anterior cord is involved in this case. It's it's like a different, completely different kind of scenario we would see. You can say like TB's dorsalis, only the dorsal column is involved, which is caused by tertiary syphilis. Um, yeah, it does. But there would be like this pupillary abnormalities as well, in that case as well. In a nutshell, this entire question has been a little bit of a mystery to me as well. But anemia, posterior cord, I guess it, it gives us the answer. It's like vitamin B12 deficiency. And I guess one thing that can happen is like since you have like already a little bit of uh, I mean degeneration of the spinocerebellar tracts, what will you what what generally you would say, I guess this one is still a woman who is like very early stages. So in early stages, you might not uh, have like problems with the spinal cerebellar tracts. So I guess in that sense, in that sense, we can say like okay, uh, the reflexes are intact in this case. Other ones like anterior cord syndrome, there is loss of motor command, bilateral loss of heat and pain, patient has not lost motor function, so it cannot be this. Then central cord syndrome presents as a combination of motor and sensory loss, usually bladder dysfunction, the patient does not display motor loss or bladder dysfunction, hemicord syndrome, we you know brown sickbird syndrome, motor dysfunction, reflex dysfunction, ipsilaterally at the level of the lesion, loss of upper motor command, below the lesion ipsilaterally spastic paresis and loss of dorsal column carried sensation ipsilaterally at and below the lesion and loss of pain and temperature sensation contralaterally two to three vertebra below the lesion. Segmentary syndrome is a congenital failure to develop part of the spinal cord the new onset of symptoms at 82 years very unlikely. Next question we move on. 39 year old man comes to the physician because of darkening of his skin and fatigue during the past four months. Three year history of type 1 DM treated with insulin. Physical examination shows hepatomegaly as well as there is testicular atrophy. Very difficult question to be honest. Just with this small amount of information you have been provided, it's really difficult to crack this question out. See, like Sodium is 138, potassium is 4.1, AST is 45, ALT is a little high, testosterone is really decreased. Now you can think like, where does testosterone decrease? Well, like, the, the first thing that comes into my mind <clears throat> while talking about testosterone would be about in case of liver failure, you would see like an increase in uh, metabolism of, I mean there is a decrease in metabolism of estrogen so yeah that would increase as well as there is an increase in testosterone when which gets like aromatized and gets into estrogen so in that in that sense okay liver disease but it wouldn't be low it would be high here like the question is stating it's low plus ALT is high that means there is some hepatocyte damage that has happened plus there is darkening of his skin there is fatigue for past four months. Type 1 DM insulin, okay, it can happen, but still you have to remember. Diabetes mellitus, hyperpigmentation, a darkening of the skin, hepatitis, 
it it all points toward one thing and that is we have to remember this thing definitely this one is pointing towards uh, hemochromatosis which is like a problem like where there's an increase in ferritin so we go back to first aid and we look into hemochromatosis we give it a search is like the cause of liver cancer. It's like the rapid notes. See, there will be multiple blood transfusions or hereditary HFEG mutation. It can result in heart failure, which would like give us the finding of the fatigue. Bronze diabetes will increase risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Hemochromatosis is in chromosome 6, the gene HFE gene, the autosomal recessive disease. You should remember like which are autosomal dominant and which are autosomal recessive. It would, it would come as a reflex to you basically like after you have studied for a while. Uh, vitamin C excess, it can worsen hereditary hemochromatosis since like, uh, I mean, if you have vitamin C, you would like absorb more of fetus, more of iron. A3 hemochromatosis, this is how I remember it. HLA A3. Uh, free radical injury can happen. It causes dilated cardiomyopathy, which can lead to heart failure at some point. I need to remember one thing, like see, like hemochromatosis is also associated with restrictive or infiltrative cardiomyopathies, like all of them, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis. Hepatocellular carcinoma, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin, aflatoxin from aspergillus, may lead to Bocciari syndrome, there will be increased alpha beta protein associated with HBV, primary malignant tumor, plus minus cirrhosis will be there. Hemochromatosis, an autosomal recessive disease, C282Y mutation on the HFE gene located in chromosome 6 associated with HNAA3 leads to abnormal iron sensing, an increased intestinal absorption of ferritin iron and there will be decreased DIBC, there will be an increase in transferrin saturation. Iron overload can also be secondary to chronic transfusion due to like metathalassemia major. Iron accumulates and especially in the liver, pancreas, skin, heart and iron can be identified in liver MRI or biopsy with crucial blue stain. <coughs> It presents after age 40 when total body iron is greater than 20 grams and there is iron loss through menstruation slows the progression in women. Classic triad of cirrhosis, diabetes mellitus, there is skin pigmentation, uh, I mean what we saw like the rose diabetes, also causes restrictive cardiomyopathy or dilated there will be hypogonadism, there will be arthropathy, which is the calcium pyrophosphate deposition. What is this thing, calcium pyrophosphate? This one is pseudocout, especially in the MCP, and repeated phlebotomy, deferoxyrax, deferoxamine, and deferiprone. This thing would help with iron chelation. 
Uh, one thing we need to remember is that when the ferritin is increased, iron is increased, we understood it. But what about this transferrin saturation? Transferrin saturation is basically serum iron divided by uh, total iron binding capacity. And you can see it, like whenever the TIBC is low, transferrin saturation would be high. That's like kind of a norm. And you can understand it, it's, it pretty much makes sense like this way. Like you see like the ferritin is high, iron is high. Now TIBC means what? Total iron binding capacity. Now when your iron is already high, already your serum iron is high, do you need like the capacity or, or like the TIBC to be really high? You really need it, like the total iron binding capacity to be really high. It doesn't need to be high because like the ferritin or the serum iron is already so high, like the body would think, okay, like I don't need to waste so much energy into it. So in that sense, like the transferrin saturation, it would increase. Transferrin is more of like a receptor or a transporter, so it needs to increase in order to uh, transport all the iron inside the body. Okay, and another thing we need to see, like the last one, let's see here, in this page. This one is this uh, histological picture. You can see, like, there are a lot of, um, there are like a lot of fat cells. There is like this uh, bone, you can see, in the cortex. This one is the medulla. And in the medulla, there is lot lots lots of iron and this one is a Prussian blue stain. Remember like we do this Prussian blue stain to stain iron and whenever you see like this iron related stuff and this blue color it's Prussian blue stain to be honest most of the times. Okay we move on to the next question. This one is like 65 year old woman develops DVT on the right lower extremity 10 days after she underwent a uh, right hip replacement. She has been receiving subcutaneous anticoagulant therapy since the procedure. Her platelet count is like 75,000 compared with 3 lakh 10 days ago. Which of the following is the most likely underlying cause of this patient's condition? Now see this question, the most important thing in this question is basically It's basically this thing, like the subcutaneous anticoagulant therapies. This part is the most important thing. Now, what would you give, like subcutaneous and anticoagulant therapy? It is heparin, subcutaneously given heparin. And after you have initiated the heparin therapy, what happened is like, the platelet count has already fallen drastically. So, it's a classic case for heparin induced thrombocytopenia. We can look into a little bit of the pharmacology of the heparin here. Okay, so about this question, what we can see is that we need to go inside the first state. And in, in the first stage, you would see this thing in hematology and oncology section. So basically, here this is the coagulation and kinin pathway. Uh, there is this intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. In the intrinsic pathway, there is 12, 11, 9, and 8. In the extrinsic, it's 7. So uh, there are two main targets like for drug, like the thrombin and the factor 10A. Uh, thrombin is inactivated or it's uh, inhibited by heparin at a greater extent compared to LMWH, which is the low molecular weight heparin. And low molecular weight heparin basically inhibits factor 10A. 
We have some direct fat protein inhibitors such as like Epexaban, Rivaroxaban, which is generally used like in case of let's suppose a DVT or something like this. And in this case, what we are seeing like this direct thrombin inhibitors, this is Targatroban, Rivalirudine and Dabigatra. This is basically, basically Dabigatra is used for heparin induced thrombocytopenias. And here this one is like the vitamin K dependent coagulation components. We see like the factor is like 2, 7, 9, 10, yes, it gets like activated by this gamma glutamyl carboxylase. There was this oxidized vitamin which got like reduced to vitamin K, which is the active form. Uh, it was inhibited by warfarin and liver failure. So basically from here on there are two pathways. One is this thrombin pathway, another is this com uh, complex forms which like ultimately like cleaves and inactivates factor 5A and 8A. We would be more concerned about this thing here because this is where like heparin generally acts. Heparin enhances the activity of this thing called antithrombic 3. So if you activate this thing, let's suppose this thing, what would happen? This would inhibit the thrombin. It would inhibit 7A, 9A, 10A, 11A, 12A. So let's go here. 7A, which is like the extrinsic pathway, okay? 9A, 10A, 11A, 12A. So this entire thing is inhibited already by uh, heparin. And heparin also inhibits this thing, thrombin. So what is the net effect if you think about? It? Well, uh, heparin, I mean, as we have already talked about it, like heparin is like, on this pathway, this intrinsic pathway, warfarin on the extrinsic pathway, the heparin mainly like acts here, okay. And here you see two seven nine ten. This two seven nine ten, this thing is in inactivated by the warfarin, so it works on the extrinsic pathway. That's that's why. And yeah, and basically like this part, you see, like cleaves and inactivates 5A and 8A. This thing, you could have like a random question somewhere, like they would ask you, like, but this factor 5 light mutations. Factor 5 light mutations produces a factor 5, which is resistant to inhibition by activated protein C. So that's why like the, for thrombolysis, TPA is used clinically as a thrombolytic. So factor 5 Leiden mutation, it's, in, it's like resistant to inhibition by activated protein C. So what happens, this factor 5A turns on this entire pathway, this cascade goes on. So there is a basically like a hypercoagulable state throughout the entire body. That's how you remember this thing. We move on to the next question. This one is like a 47 year old woman with MS is brought to the physician because of two day history of bilateral lower extremity numbness, uh, muscle strength 5 by 5 upper extremity spastic paresis of the lower extremities, DER are risk in the lower extremities and there is sustained flowness in the ankles. Mavinsky sign is present bilaterally, proprioception and sensation to vibration and termination in the toes. Sensation to pin at temperature and normal. When asked to stand with her eyes closed and arms extended, the patient is unable to maintain balance. So what does it what does it basically say? It's a sensitivity. I mean this is quite like a buzzword. So there is impairment of sensory proprioception, which is like basically other way of seeing Romberg sign. So Romberg sign is positive here. So we need to remember where is this Romberg sign positive and how does it stay positive and what 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 is, what are they talking about? Right. Mm, basically, here the answer would be uh, this dorsal spinal cerebellar tracts. Now. Generally, like in general, the answers should be dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. But in this case, this is a special case. You would see one thing where you need to be really very careful about analyzing this kind of questions. 
there is spastic paraparesis of the lower bilateral lower extremities so you are dealing here with extremities okay lower extremities which is completely like ataxia and you are talking here about ipsilateral distal limb muscles affected then you would get like limb ataxia on one side ipsilaterally but here it's bilateral and basically it's the truncal ataxia and the truncal ataxia it's like there's a lesion in the spinocerebellum you need to remember this thing it's quite important and now the question would come is it ventral or dorsal dorsal is generally for unconscious proprioception where you don't know ventral is like for conscious proprioception so it's dorsal spinal cerebellum tract so basically here what the answer should be it should be like the spinal cerebellum and for the answer to be spinal cerebellum we need to understand like where does this spinal cerebellum ultimately goes spinal cerebellum uh, ultimately reaches the see like the cornice and the intermediate zones it's like the distal portion of the limbs yeah so for this question in order to understand this question you need to know about like most of the pathways you need to know about the pathways of the cerebellum as well as many parts of the brain so making it short here like cerebellum has like a lot of pathways there is contralateral pontines ponto cerebellar pathways ventral spinal cerebellar then dorsal spinal cerebellar vestibular cerebellar lots of pathways whatever it may be this specific thing here which is this Romberg sign you wouldn't see this kind of Romberg sign in case of cerebellar lesion that's pretty sure so where do you see this kind of uh, Romberg sign you would see it in Frederick ataxia you would see it in uh, vitamin B12 deficiency or in case of demyelination this kind of diseases here this question whatever it is like we don't know what is the diagnosis right now but most likely it looks like it's the vitamin b12 deficiency and in vitamin b12 deficiency since it's talking about like bilateral uh, paraparesis of the lower extremities we should remember like this kind of proprioceptive information is carried by the two nucleus basically not nucleus i would say lemniscus like fasciculus they create let's suppose uh, cuneatus fasciculus and gracilis fasciculus so in this case whatever it might be we know it's gonna be either like one of those diseases so here i guess my answer would be fasciculus gracilis gracilis is for legs you need is for the upper extremity you can go and look into first aid a little bit you see in the first aid they have talked about this but i think talk about the extremities So here you see like there is the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. So basically like here if you think like the head is here, the leg is here. In this case here you would see like the head is here, the leg is here. It's kind of like a visual representation you can remember this way. You see gracilis lower body, cuneatus upper body arms. So quite a tricky question. A 32-year-old woman comes to the emergency department after a 
one after taking 41 milligram tablets of alprazolam. She, she says that her boyfriend threatened to leave her and she feels empty. She drinks several packs of beer weekly and uses cocaine daily. She has outbursts of rage whether or not she is intoxicated. Which of the following is the most likely personality disorder to talk about? It's pretty easy. It's going to be a borderline personality disorder. I need to show you the picture there. Stuff that's written. These questions are like the more you practice, the more it would come to sense. So you see, like there are cluster, clusters of personality disorders. There are like cluster A, cluster B, and cluster C. Amongst the class to be, you would find there is antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. So in borderline, they have like unstable mood and interpersonal relationships. They have this fear of abandonment. They have impulsivity. They have self-mutilation, suicidality, sense of emotional emptiness. Females are more sufferer than males, and spinning is a major defense mechanism in this case. Going on to the next question, a 62 year old woman brought to the emergency department 30 minutes, 30 minutes remember it, after her husband found her on the bedroom floor awake but unable to move her arms and legs. Uh, she has had a history of type 2 DM, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, current medication like insulin, clonidine, simvastatin, blood pressure is so high. Horizontal eye movements are impaired, bilateral vertical eye movements are intact, we are talking about. Speech is dysarthric, examination of the extremities show quadriplegia. This thing is pretty much easy. Uh, this is basically like, like, it's a problem, we all know, it's like on the pawns. It should be like cardiovascular basilar insufficiency, which is basically a locked in syndrome we have talked about it in the neuro section in first day uh, basically like in first day you will find out most of the answers to your questions basal artery, uh, pons, medulla, lower midbrain, anywhere this can be a, there can be a lesion, it's a locked in syndrome, mostly like see like this basilar system if you were see the picture, it's mostly situated on the see this one, this one is like the vertebral arteries, they make up this basal artery then it gets divided so the first division here is pica, then the ica, then SCA. Uh, so basically, uh, these are parts of like here, whatever they dividing here, or even here. Like it's like uh, it's like entirely posterior circulation, and anywhere around here, if you have some lesion or whatever it is, it can entirely disrupt the entire circulation here so it can cause this thing called locked-in syndrome very important to remember for the board's purpose so remember it locked it's really difficult to ride with the mouse it's known as locked in syndrome moving on to the next question this is a very weird question like hope this kind of question doesn't come on the exam it doesn't show up 
even if it shows that it's going to be really difficult to come to this kind of solution or conclusion. Basically, they have shown in like an insect here. They have been talking about it here. Like this one is like a bed bug. He makes no small bugs in their beds. Now, it's not. Yeah, so it has like small bugs and these are like bed bugs. So they have been asking what is the thing like this girl is associated with uh, for the infection and then this thing can carry like this can this thing can be a vector for which one of these things that they ask for this thing. Mm, basically it's staph aureus. I've looked up into forums in many places and basically it makes sense because they they're the vector vector for like the step aureus and they can cause like a lot of problems they have been associated with the abscesses uh, cellulitis this kind of infections so it's it's a random question hope this doesn't show up on exam this kind of questions Whatever. Uh, next question. Let's see here. This thing, whatever you are seeing here, uh, you can see it clearly. It's the liver section. Multiple lesions on the liver. Don't think too much. Just go and choose the metastatic breast cancer. You know, like any metastasis to the liver would have like multilobular lesion, or it would be like multiple patchy lesions on the parenchyma of the liver. Next question, we are moving on. Uh, we are basically like moving on to more of important questions because these are some of the questions you would, you would have seen it or there are a few questions which are like so weird even if you try a thousand times it's going to be really difficult to remember but still everything is important. A 16-month-old boy is brought to the physician for a follow-up examination. He has had recurrent bacterial infection since the age of 8 months. Findings on a complete blood count including leukocyte differential are within the reference range. Further testing of the patient's leukocyte shows normal oxidative burst. His serum even the globulin concentrations are uniformly decreased. Which of the following additional findings is most likely in this patient we have been talking about? Okay, so they have said like it's a it's a patient, 16 month old boy. There were recurrent bacterial infections since age of 8 months. And it showed like normal oxidative burst. That means like your uh, NADPH is normal. It basically says. So it's not gonna, gonna be Shedia Kigashi. Serum even the global concentrations are uniformly decreased. And this one is really something to remember. Now think about it like this. When immunoglobulins are decreased, we need to find out, we, need, we can understand it's the B cell deficiency. Now we need to think, is it just B cell or there is associated T cell deficiency as well? And for that, we will go to immunology and look into the stuff they're talking about. So you can see like there is this B-cell deficiency disorder like this glutosagamoglobulinemia. Here you would have like this absent B-cells in the periphery, decreased immunoglobulin in all classes. And it's like after six months of infection, there is recurrent infections from bacteria and viruses. There will be absent germinal centers. Fine. Another one there is which is known as skid. In skid, which is like both a B and T cell disorder, you would have basically like the same kind of things, but skid would be like there would be like some other infections as well, along with it, like viral infections, fungal infections. It's like genetic component is there, most common is like interleukin 2 receptor gamma gene. X linked recessive, T amine deficiency, it's like autosomal recessive in that sense. You would have to do like this flow cytometry to find out like what is the number of T cells here. 
germinal centers would be absent, thymic shadow would be absent. And in our question, if you see carefully, they didn't include anything like of a viral or fungal infection, it's just bacterial infection. So the answer is like pretty much like a easy picking for us. It's going to be absence of germinal centers in the lymph nodes. This one is Bruton, that's it. Just remember this thing. It's Bruton's gamma globulinemia. Okay, next question. A 56-year-old woman comes to the physician because of three-week history of increasing weakness of her arms and legs. She has smoked one pack of, pack of cigarettes daily for 30 years. Physical examination shows pronounced weakness of the hip caudal muscles, lesser weakness of the shoulder caudal muscles, both of which improve with repeated testing. A chest x-ray shows a hilar lamp mass. Electromyography is compatible with a malfunction of the neuromuscular junction. Impairment of which of the following is the most likely cause? Okay. One pack of cigarette daily. This is the main thing they're talking about. Improves with repeated testing. Highland landmass. Now, just think about it. There are two things which have this kind of unique buzzwords to them associated. Myasthenia gravis. You work more, you get more tired, you get fatigability. So there's like, with work, with exertion, there is fatigability. With lambert eaton it's a completely different thing. In lambert eaton like, you, you work and basically like you improve. It's like this. And with lambert eaton so this, this thing is lambert eaton we understood it. Now lambert eaton is associated with what? It's associated with? like the presynaptic calcium channels we need to remember this thing presynaptic calcium channels there's like some i mean antibody against them so what would happen like calcium won't enter inside the synapse i mean inside the presynaptic membrane it won't fuse and like the vesicles wouldn't be there and basically like the entire acetylcholine won't be released. So the first choice they have given acetylcholine esterase doesn't make sense. It won't be the, the answer. Binding of acetylcholine on the postsynaptic membrane. Yeah, this one is like for myasthenia gravis. Direct depolarization of the muscle fibers by calcium. No, doesn't make sense. Postsynaptic. Uh, Postsynaptic uh, membrane potential. No. Presynaptic release of acetylcholine. Yeah, definitely because you don't have calcium, acetylcholine is not being released. So this thing is impaired. We have talked about here, like impairment. So yeah, it's presynaptic release of acetylcholine. It's known as Lambert Yeaton myasthenic syndrome and we can look into it a little bit we can look into some pictures like what are they talking about then we would be able to visualize this stuff see like they're talking here about Still loading, it's not a good picture, whatever. Okay, so you can see here there is this myelin sheet, there is this axon terminals. So, what happens? There is this, there is a calcium channel here, and from here, like presynaptic calcium channel, calcium enters, there would be vesicles inside, and this calcium along with the acetyl CoA which has been like coming from the glycolysis pathway inside the cell then it will be turned into acetyl CoA from there that acetyl and here the choline they would bind together they would fuse in the vesicle and 
with the help of calcium, they would fuse here and they would be released. That would work on this postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. So, here, if the problem is here, as my senior brevis, if the problem is somewhere around here, where there is a presynaptic calcium channel, that would be Lambert here to myasthenic syndrome. Moving on to the next question, a 31 year old primary gravid woman at 28 weeks gestation comes to the physician because of one week history of a non-productive pulp. Temperature is 38.6, pulse is 88, respirations at 24, blood pressure is 128 by 88, uh, laboratory studies, chest x-ray, there is interstitial pneumonia, they are talking about like this mouse doesn't work properly basically. I mean, it's really difficult to navigate a mouse. Tetracycline is contraindicated in this patient because of its toxicity to which of the following organs in the fetus. So they have talked about tetracycline here. And which one amongst this tetracycline? I mean, what is going to be the toxicity of this tetracycline? They're asking this thing. And it's like, it's pretty easy, I guess. On this sense, and think of it like it's gonna be bone. Tetracycline problems with decreased like calcium absorption with tetracycline, so there would be like osteopenias with tetracycline. It's an easy question. Yes. Next one. We can look into first thing if required. This question. Look into like micro. Look into the section. And talk about it. Like adverse effects of tetracycline, there's discoloration of the teeth and inhibition of bone growth. Very important inhibition of bone growth in children, photosensitivity, discoloration of the teeth, contraindicated in pregnancy. And it's contraindicated for this reason basically like, do not take tetracyclines with milk, which is calcium, or antacids, which is like calcium or magnesium, or iron containing preparations because divalent cation inhibits drugs absorption in the gut. So it's like iron containing preparations uh, because this iron containing preparations uh, they inhibit the absorption in the gut basically. Which of the following sets of serum findings most likely in a 50 year old man with recently diagnosed CKD, I mean a chronic renal failure or whatever, same thing. So what do we find in CKD? It's pretty easy. Like with CKD, you would see like increased phosphate, uh, decreased calcium. There'll be increased parathyroid. So you find it out. So it should be this one, C. Why? The question might come why. Well, to answer that, we would go back to first aid. Uh, we would look into renal. Basically, So these are the consequences of renal failure they're talking about. See this thing called renal osteodystrophy. What is this thing? There is hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, failure of vitamin D hydroxylation, which is associated with chronic kidney disease. Now, whenever you have a CKD, basically, you, would, you wouldn't be able to hydroxylate the vitamin Ds. 
and remember it or not like this vitamin D hydroxylation it was uh, discussed in the uh, endocrine section of first aid so you can see here like uh, basically this hydroxylation state one alpha hydroxylase parathyroid hormone basically like parathyroid hormone acts like on the on the distal convoluted tubule and so if you have decreased calcium and increased phosphate or if you have decreased vitamin D3 you can see like there are four parathyroid glands they talked about parathyroid hormone being released then it goes inside and it works with 25 hydroxy polycalciferol to make 125 dihydroxy polycalciferol in presence of one of the hydroxylase so basically like the main thing you need to remember this um, one one of their steps it takes place in the liver one step another step the last one one of the hydroxylase is activated by parathyroid hormone it takes place in the kidneys so anytime you have a problem with anytime you have some problem with the kidney uh, there would be like chronic kidney disease and that would lead to hypocalcemia from hypocalcemia you can have hyperparathyroidism and that hyperparathyroidism can ultimately cause like more of calcium but the phosphate wouldn't be able to be uh, excreted because there is CKD and at some point if secondary hyperparathyroidism isn't managed properly it becomes like a an autonomous region where they like when the parathyroid becomes so autonomic autonomous they secrete parathyroid hormone on their own and that might lead to tertiary hyperparathyroidism and that's like you would find this thing in really late cases the trick about this question was they have said recently diagnosed that means what what do you find just like you have now CKD what do you find and that one is like you have high phosphate, low calcium, high parathyroids. That's it. Now comes I have a lot of uh, pictures with this questions here, so it will be fun now studying. Uh, they have talked here about electrical stimulation of the steroid ganglia, and they would say like which one would increase. Steroid ganglia is basically like a sympathetic ganglia see i have a note here uh, it is formed by fusion of the inferior cervical ganglia and the first thoracic ganglia so basically like it's present in 80 percent of the cases and it's in front of the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra so here they have seen like this one is the stalate ganglia so the question might come like why do you need it I have a note here, like what are the indications of steroid ganglia? It's basically for regional pain syndromes, type 1 and 2 refractory angina with phantom limb pain, with vascular insufficiency, like uh, with Renat syndrome, scleroderma, frostbite, obliterative vascular disease, vasospasm, vascular reconstruction, and limb reimplantation. And there can be even edema where we would need surgery so in that case is like steroid ganglia is like blocked but here the question is not about blocking see like their question is about increase and with steroid ganglia so think about it if you increase which is basically more of like a cervical thoracic region ganglia and like it's a sympathetic ganglia so if you still like sympathetic activity it would definitely increase heart rate none of the other answer choices fit the scenario what they asked for so like if you increase sympathetic activity there will be bronchodilation 
uh, glandular secretion with C's in case of esophagus. Peristalsis would be really less in esophagus, as well as uh, like sympathetic activity. You know, like there's a special like sympathetic activity for like the eocrine and hippocrine sweat glands, and basically they increase the sweat, increase sweating. So sympathetic activity controls sweating, and the sweating is generally controlled. Like most of them, we know like is controlled by acetylcholine uh, sorry is controlled by norepinephrine only sweating is controlled by acetylcholine you can look into this we have talked about it in pharmacology or economic pharmacology see like the sweat glands this is a sympathetic host sweat glands acts on the mascarinic receptor sweat glands so this one is really different. Another one is like this epinephrine thing. Yeah, that's it basically for here. Moving on to the next question. To find out like, which of the following properties of integral membrane proteins result in, become, in their becoming anchored within the membrane. Now for this, for answering this, you need to know the fluid mosaic mo model really well otherwise it's really going to be difficult to answer this kind of questions uh, we know like in the fluid mosaic model there is like hydrophobic I mean, there are two hydrophobic layers and uh, there are hydrophilic layers as well see the hydrophobic layers are like uh, here you see like this one are basically the hydrophilic layers inside things are like the hydrophobic tail and the hydrophobic layer have like a phosphate head along with it so you can see like this one is the hydrophilic head this is the hydrophobic tail this one is the entire phospholipid they're talking about so what happens a phosphate is attached with this tail which is basically fatty acid tails it is attached by means of a glycerol so they have asked like which of the following properties of integral membrane proteins the proteins which which spans through the entire plasma membrane they would be attached with which part so it's like there is fatty acid, you can see, there is phosphate, there is glycerol, which one would it be attached with? Extensive hydrogen bonding of amino acid side chains of the protein and the membrane phospholipids. Is there protein here? Do you see any protein here? I don't see. Extensive hydrophobic interactions between the amino acid side chains of the protein and the membrane phospholipid tails. So, so they have talked here about extensive hydrogen bonding of the amino acid side chains of the protein and the membrane phospholipid tails. They're talking here about proteins, so hydrogen bonding inside doesn't make that much sense. If it's a hydrophobic interaction, which is true inside, you would have a hydrophobic interaction that would like adhere it or keep it in place and would keep it, uh, it would help the protein to be anchored within the membrane. So I guess this one makes sense. C should be the answer. You can look into this uh, picture again and again if required. This is quite an important concept. You need to remember these things, otherwise it's going to be difficult to answer this kind of questions. This one is an uh, interesting thing. Uh, while studying for this, I researched a little bit and I found like this guy, like Betson, he worked really hard to find out like uh, 
he had like I guess his wife or somebody who died out of like breast cancer and then he researched extensively like why like how does like uh, breast cancer or like number of cancers basically like uh, like you can see there are, there is the note I have here see like the cancers of the pelvis and during the prostate uh, spread to the lumbosacral spine by the vertebral venous plexus see like this there is this epidural venous plexus is inside this is like vertebral venous plexus basically and it has connections uh, vertebral venous plexus runs up the entire spinal column and connects with the venous supply of the brain via a valveless system which is known as the big sense plexus very important is valveless so it's bi-directional it can regulate the flow of the CSR and via this procedure what they can attain is uh, they can like like they can keep the intracranial pressure under control and this vertebral venous plexus also communicates with the azygous vein in the chest which explains in part why breast and lung cancers frequently metastasize to the thoracic spine so breast cancer and lung cancer it goes to the thoracic spine prostate cancer goes to the lumbar spine you know and then it can like ascend upwards and go into the brain as well so this is the entire system of like metastasis most of the metastasis we know most common is basically lymphatic metastasis but secondly there is another type which is known as hematogenous this is kind of a hematogenous one and otherwise like the entire cancer cells can seed into like body cavities they can invade through vessels membranes lots of stuff so these are the modalities how like cancers are spread So you can see like here from pelvis it can send upwards from the ribs from the breast even it can go even into the brain from here so it's important to remember this thing i've seen a lot of questions they ask about this certain thing and this is also important for clinical purposes as well like you need to know like how how like this cancer is a very common and you need to know how they metastasize next question quite a complicated stuff they're talking here about nmda there was a girl two year old brought to the physician she had cross eye physical examination showed like moderate strabismus now the question asked like if the girl was not treated she will most likely have deficits in perception due to lack of appropriate competitive interactions in the visual cortex a calcium entry through each of the following receptors mediates the outcome of this competitive process. Uh, basically, if I never reviewed this question before, or I don't know, like if, if I couldn't have answered this thing pretty surely because it's really difficult. I mean, your brain doesn't have space to think about NMDA receptors after having like a lot of things like nitty-gritty details of like a lot of small topics inside the first aid and many other books different resources it's but it's still important and nba receptors are like some important type of receptors you need to have idea about um you can see here like i have given a lot of pathways basically uh the pathways are for like Locus ceruleus, we know it's like for the norepinephrine, raffinucleus is for the serotonin. There are like two color coded things, you see. The dopamine just goes into this frontal cortex, serotonin goes all the way, and GABA it has also a lot of connections. So this is just to show you the connections they have. So they say like calcium entry through each of the following receptors. 
So this one is the confirmation of the NMDA receptors you can see. There is like this, uh, it is some somewhat a very special type of receptor which basically needs a little bit of depolarization to work on the first place. Otherwise it doesn't work that well. Um, you can see here there is like a channel like potassium which basically like cannot go out because magnesium blocks this. So resting magnesium would block this. So the answer was like there was a competitive process and calcium entry through which of the following receptor mediates the outcome of this competitive process. The answer was basically NMDA because they are talking about the resting state here and whenever it is a resting state and a competitive process it is going to be NMDA basically. Um, see like glutamate is also like some agonist co-agonist or glycine and deserine and the mantin is like some calcium channel blocker not calcium sorry like this magnesium channel would be blocked potassium won't be able to leave sodium calcium won't be able to enter inside and basically that's it there is like important one again like where like this there is this NMDA receptor antagonist like ketamine and uh, phencyclidine PCP. These things like activate, I mean, these things act on this place we talked about. And there is a partial agonist known as refastinol. It can also work there. So, this one is like about the NMDA receptors and its pharmacology. Uh, I have got a book, this book is known as Neuroscience, I will show you some pictures from here. There is a chapter here, if, if, you, if you people get time to look into this chapter for the major neurotransmitters, you would get a lot of knowledge about how neurotransmitters work. The entire chapter and it's so beautiful this book is it's I guess a must read for most of the medical students in order to have a very good clear conception about this neurotransmitters see like there are small molecule neurotransmitters there are biogenic amines amino acids purines basically ATP depolarizes membrane that's why like they're talking here about purines being like a separate entity which basically are somehow called neurotransmitters indolamine which is like serotonin histamine is there and then there is peptide neurotransmitters these peptide neurotransmitters are these are basically like opioids opioids work through this way and then they would explain you like with super details with super crisp pictures you can like understand if you give a little bit of time into reading through this thing it's awesome like it's really nice the way they have explained it in a really simple manner they have really good visuals so yeah if, if you get time this book is known as neuroscience uh, it was written by it's the third edition i got it like from some journal in NCBI, Neuroscience written by Dale Perves, George G. Augustine and a couple of other brilliant minds I would say. If you need like more knowledge about neurotransmitters you can refer to this book. This is a beautiful book. Anyway next question we are moving on to. A 45 year old woman is brought to the emergency department because of a one day history of fever and constant right sided abdominal pain. Uh, she has had previous episodes of similar pain after high fat meals but they have always resolved in the past. 
temperature is 38.3, pulse is 102, blood pressure is 100 by 60. Which of the following findings is most likely the abdominal examination? Uh, it's a pretty easy question. They're talking here about cholecystitis. Now, it is acute cholecystitis, that's pretty sure. Now, acute cholecystitis can be a number of reasons. One can be like due to like gallstone, it can be a calculus as well. So, what they have given you a hint here about is like they have given you high fat meals. So, when you are given high fat meals, it activates the cholecystokinin receptors, and like cholecystokinin acts there, it increases the motility, more bile is released, and basically that would create this biliary colic. Uh, this one is confused with acalculus because like it's same thing you would find but acalculus cholecystitis is generally found in critically ill patients okay this one is just one day history of fever and constant right sided abdominal pain seems very unlikely and you can see this thing you know this one is morphe sign uh, this there is this thing this way the way you do it with all the ball of your right and left hand that one is like moini hands method and basically like what i did or like i guess most of my colleagues did during internship it was uh, using like this method they're talking about the moini hands modification where you where you place the left thumb and then you tell the patient like to breathe he heavily i mean to take a deep inspiration and at the zenth of inspiration there will be uh, and then breath catching so you see this thing say this buzzword is known as breath catching and that thing is known as morphous sign and if it's positive it is acute cholecystitis they talk about next question we move on to a 68 year old man who has been treated for past four weeks with new nsa drug for ra as severe gastric burning and discomfort, a second drug decreases this adverse effects. But the patient develops severe diarrhea. The second drug most likely acts and which of the following sites they talked about. Here, like the drug they say it, um, like NSC is given, they have already said for rheumatoid arthritis. And in order to uh, in order to decrease the adverse effect, we should give something like mesoprostol, which acts on this prostaglandin E receptors. Now you can see like what happens with NSAIDs, like why would I give mesoprostol? Like with NSAIDs, you can remember like from the first aid, there was this thing called Al prostanil you look into I don't know where did it come at all. Okay, yeah. So basically like you see like this NSAIDs, they inhibit COX1, COX2, like this prostacyclin, prostaglandin, and thromboxin, this entire pathway is disrupted somehow. So what would happen like you would have decreased levels of prostacyclin, prostaglandin, and thromboxin. So this prostaglandin, as we know, this prostaglandin has like some kind of housekeeping function they say about. And this housekeeping function is like protection of the gastric mucosa. So what would be the fix here? The fix would be give back prostaglandins. And that's why we give like this prostaglandin analogs here. Prostaglandin E1, prostaglandin analog, mesoprostol is a prostaglandin analog. Now, mesoprostol is also used as like an abortifacient with uh, mifepristol, which is like a progesterone antagonist. So, yeah. And they have said like the patient develops severe diarrhea. This one is a little bit tricky because nobody can remember this thing. Like with mesoprostol, you can basically get diarrhea as an adverse effect. And basically, that is really difficult to remember because um, there are a lot of things to remember.
see that it has an adverse effect of misoprostol in the uh, GI section, you will find out. It's contraindicated in women of childbearing potential due to being an abortive patient. We move on to the next question. A 65-year-old man recovering from cerebral infarction due to atherosclerotic vascular disease begins treatment with warfarin. A floppy dog will is added to the medication regimen because of his intolerance to aspirin. Which of the following is the most likely mechanism of decreased platelet aggregation due to floppy dog will in this patient? Oh, the floppy dog will in this patient is added to the medication regimen. They have said, where does floppy dog will work? Pretty easy thing. It prevents ADP stimulated platelet activation. It was a very easy question, I would say. If somebody has been studying for you, step one, they must be knowing it right now. It's like something you must know. ADP receptor inhibitors are clopidogrel, trasugrel, ticagrelor, which is like irreversible. Clopidogrel like inhibits it irreversibly completely. Hyglopidin also works there. And you can see the visuals they have provided here. Beautiful visual they have for this him or no. I really like this chapter because the, the visuals are really nice and they help you remember. See here, like they talked about like this things, this thing, and you see, like in thrombogenesis, quite. They have talked about it basically here, like clopidogrel, prasugrel, tyclopidine inhibits this ADP P2Y12 receptors. Okay, we move on to the next question. 65 year old woman with diabetic ketoacidosis has had a fever and proptosis of the left eye over the past three days. Uh, she is unable to move the left eye. A black eschker is present on the nasal mucosa. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Like, it's, it's not that difficult to remember. Diabetic ketoacidosis they talked about. There is black eschker present. How do you come to like a good diagnosis? Now, you you might tell me like, Okay, like there is aspergillosis as well as mucormycosis. Why would I choose like mucormycosis? Basically, mucormycosis is like associated with DKA and it's more common. And like it forms the ash cards and everything. There I have notes you can see mucor, rhizopus, zygomycophycota. Then, like irregular, broad, non septate hyphae branching at the wide angles. So, basically, they are talking here about this picture which I have from the first aid. Like this one, you're seeing here, like this one is like aseptate. Aseptate means like it doesn't have a lot of branching compared to this one, which has a lot of branching. And in this case, you can see like it's a little bit of uh, it's a little bit the high fees are a little bit broad compared to like this one which is like thinner high fee you see this picture this one is like a zoomed in version this one is a less zoomed in version but this one is a better like comparison so you see this this high fee are broad they are acetate they are branching like at 90 degree angles 
and it's, it's described as like this, a ribbon-like hyphae, ribbon-like aspergillus hyphae, aspergillus is 17 hyphae, that branch at 45 degree angle, it's like C, like there is aspergillus, which is like A, and how, how much would be the angle? To remember it's going to be like this. This is how you remember aspergillus. Now you need to know like what aspergillus is associated with. Aspergillus is associated with basically it can cause like this ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. It can cause this cavitating lesions. So let's dive into it a little bit. See, aspergillus fumigators, 45 degree acute angles in immunocompromised patients, neutrophil dysfunction, which can cause like chronic granulomatous disease. Very important to remember. I don't even remember this thing. Uh, it can cause aspergillomas in pre existing lung cavities. If you have a pre existing lung cavity, like a tubercular infection, or even like some um, lesion or like some mass. From there, you can cause this aspergilloma, and some species of aspergillus produce this aflatoxin, which is like associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. For treatment, is the most important thing like that frustrates the students. Like, it's difficult to remember boriconazole or isovuconazole. This thing always is associated with aspergillus. You can give a kind of handles like caspofungin, like anidulafungin, like fungin and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is like some kind of a hypersensitivity reaction to aspergillus it is associated with asthma and cystic fibrosis it may cause bronchiectasis and eosinophilia you need to remember this eosinophilia mucorrhizopus like see like they are treated with isobuconazole uh, basically sorry i was wrong isobuconazole isn't associated with Aspergillus, isobuconazole is associated with mucor and rhizopus. You can see some other fungus like Scandida. You can see this this thing. Next question, we move on. A 42-year-old man comes to the physician because of a one-month history of intermittent high-grade fever, dizziness, diarrhea, fatigue, also has had a 5 kg weight loss during this period. During a trip to India three months ago, he was bitten by an insect and he says there is a sore developed at the side of the bite. Temperature is 38. Uh, physical examination shows splenomegaly and muscle wasting. Laboratory studies show pancytopenia, which of the following is the most likely vector. Uh, it's pretty easy, like uh, whoever knows, like wherever you find this pancytopenia thing and is asking about some protozoal infection, treat to India, it's like, we know it, it's going to be sent like here. And basically like, I. Um, I studied in Bangladesh, like in a medical school here. So, in Bangladesh, you know, like Kalazar is really common, and like it's also common in India as well. Like it's the main proportion, as far as I know, it's uh, there, like on the Bihar state of India. So, uh, basically, like doctors from this region, they have good knowledge of. Lishmania and I, I don't think so, like whoever, like the IMGs who are going to give exam from here, uh, they should know this thing really well. Lishmania, you see like visceral Lishmaniasis and there is cutaneous Lishmaniasis. Visceral is like the Kala Azar, cutaneous is like, it can cause like this post Kala Azar, dermal Lishmaniasis. What would you find and how would you diagnose it? 
you would have to do like this uh, on the splenic aspirate you can take or from the lymph node you can take whatever it is uh, what happens is like this thing you can see the life cycle here the sand fly takes a blood meal turns into chromastigotes phagocytos or macrophages then chromastigotes transform into amastigotes then like again mosquitoes take them transforms them into like ultimately the chromastigotes phase again and then it goes on like this and transmits to other humans. So in human, whether it's whether it is in blood or like lymph node, bone marrows, splenic aspirate, wherever you see like uh, you can find this thing inside the macrophages. And how do you know like this is like macrophage, not like other things? Because you see like this frosty like cytoplasm this frosty cytoplasm is like characteristic for macrophages and i have shown here some other pictures i mean some other vectors who are like creating nuisance to uh human civilization for years i would say uh the sandfly we know sandfly is leishmania donovani uh, this one is like sandfly, this is like Plebotomus, I guess. Plebotomus regitipus, it's scientific name. It carries this thing like Lishmania. And then there is this flat fly which uh, transmits river blindness, Oncocerco valvulus. And then there is Mosquitoes, as we know, that's really like so annoying. And there has been a recent outbreak in Bangladesh, like not only in Bangladesh, in a lot of places around the world, but it has heavily inflicted like this part of South Asia. And even in Southeast Asia, Philippines, then Malaysia, some other countries over there, Thailand, I guess. Uh, next question. A 62-year-old woman is brought to the physician because her left foot has become cool and discolored and she has begun to have difficulty walking. Symptoms began four hours ago with several acute episodes of palpitation followed by tingling and numbness of the left foot several hours later. She was not too concerned until the current symptoms offered. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for this one? Okay, so basically they have talked here about the sudden onset you have like your left foot going numb or discolored what might be the reason like it's pretty easy i would say it's like some embolus or thrombosis anything could have been the answer since embolus is given other things doesn't fit into it so yeah it, it is a pretty easy question this is dbt and it mean it might be due to like some uh, arrhythmia where you can have like some stroke as well as you can have some DVT going into the systemic circulation like from the femoral artery to the popliteal artery it can occlude anything from there and you can have like you can even like it can be so dangerous you can even have a loss of your limb so you need to take measures very like fast I guess if they would have asked like what would have been the next best step or what thing would you have done like best step i would say like you could have done like ultrasound like you can saw not ultrasound sorry you could have done like doppler study to see like the circulation out there and then you could have given like low molecular heparin provided you don't have any contraindication to it next question is a four-year-old boy is brought to the physician by his parents because of marked yellowing of the skin. He and his family do not eat milk, milk, eggs, or other food derived from the animal products. There have not been any, there have not been any changes in stool or urine color. Has not traveled and no member family history. I mean, there is no family history. Temperature is normal. Pulse is normal. Respiration is normal. Blood pressure is a little bit low, but I guess it's still fine for a four-year-old boy. 100 by 60. Uh, examination shows like yellow tinged skin, sclera, 
non-ecteric. Very important to remember this thing. We have seen like the sclera is non-ecteric. Which of the following intervention is most likely to improve this child's activities? So what would you give here to help this patient? Basically, like they're talking here about catatonemia. It's a little bit of a weird question. A little bit difficult to pick, pick up the answer. Catatonemia is like, you wouldn't find, you would see like there is yellow thinning of the skin. But you wouldn't find it anywhere else, like in the body, except like your palms and soles. And you can differentiate it from jaundice. Well, it has clearly said there is no jaundice because they have given some buzzwords here. He has not traveled. No member of the family history has been ill. Rules out like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis A. Doesn't eat anything outside of home. Doesn't eat junk. Not. I mean, it's not possible to have hepatitis with D or E without this B. So, jaundice is ruled out, apparently. So, you can see, like, the sequential sites of jaundice, they have top first stage, second stage, and third stage. In the first stage, there is, it's like on the frenulum of the tongue, which is like, which gets yellowish when it's like more than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. The second stage is like, uh, there is yellowing of the sclera of the eye, it becomes yellowish tinted, I guess, when it's better than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. This one, the second stage, the sclera, is most important to exclude the carotidemia here, they have talked here. Third stage is like skin, which is like, it becomes like yellowish when there is better than 3.5, and you know it, like, 1 to 3 is like, if you have 1, to three. This one is subclinical jaundice. And if it's greater than three, it's jaundice. That's how you remember it. So the best answer here would be dietary changes. You should say like okay give up a little bit of like like the fruits or stuffs which contains a lot of vitamin A because like this beta carotene isn't always also good for like your health always I mean it's good it's definitely need vitamin A but if you have hyper vitamin A it's really gonna cause you problems and you can find this thing like in the biochem they talked here about Before like starting nutrition, there was this vitamin part. They have discussed about this thing extensively. If you missed it, I'm gonna read it for you. Where is it? Okay, see, like it's in vitamin A. They have said. There is deficiency, they have talked, we know all know this thing. See, like, how does it even look like homeopathic spider spot? Uh, whenever there is like excess, you can see like either acute toxicity or like chronic toxicity, or it can be toxicity. Acute is like nausea, which is vomiting, vertigo, blurred vision, completely non specific. Chronic toxicity can cause alopecia, dry skin, scaliness, hepatic toxicity and enlargement, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I've seen questions regarding this. There would be like papilledema, arthrosis, stuff like this. And teratogenic pain, like it can cause cleft palate, cardiac abnormalities. So you wouldn't give somebody like isotretinoin, like some pregnant woman or like some newly wed couple who are like uh, already like having sex and they're going to have a baby or you're pregnant you wouldn't give them like this uh, isotretinoin because uh, if they have acne and you give them isotretinoin it's really going to hamper like the newborn 
56 year old man comes to the physician because of a severe pain in the great toe of his right foot. He says that he's allergic to aspirin and has many similar drugs. He has had four surgical procedures to remove the nasal polyps. Physical examination shows swelling and marked tenderness of the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the right foot. Microscopic examination of the joint fluid obtained by astrosynthesis so shows negatively birefringent crystals. Now, whenever you have this thing called negatively birefringent, you get it. You shouldn't miss it. And which of the following is the most appropriate acute treatment? So, think about it with each. acutely. You can give like NSAIDs, fine. You can give allopurinol, fine. You can give like steroids, it's gonna work. Chronically, you would give like fibroxostat and like other treatment options you have. So, I have a little bit of a note here. Let's see. Acute treatment, we saw it, sulfin pyrazone competitively inhibits the uric acid reabsorption in the proximal tubule of the kidney. If NSAIDs are contraindicated, we give colchicin. If NSAIDs doesn't work. And if it can't if the patient can't tolerate colchicin as well, then we use steroids. We don't go into steroids right away. But yeah, in clinical perspective, in clinical sense, if the patient is in such a pain and you think like, okay, it's not gonna work, if it's if your clinical conscience permits you to give it, you can give it. It's not a problem. Treatment of acute gout arthritis, several drugs are effective for terminating the acute gout attack. Colchicin, NSAIDs, corticosteroids are standard approaches. ACTH is also very effective, but it has become increasingly scarce because of being super expensive. Uh, regardless of the particular agent chosen, the sooner these drugs are started, the more rapid the response. If a patient cannot take NSAIDs or colchicin, the choice is among oral intraarticular or parenteral glucocorticoids. Local application of the ice packs may also help. Now, drugs that affect the serum urine concentration, allopurinol, including antihyperuricemic agent, should not be changed, started, or stopped during an attack, as this may worsen the inflammatory response already in progress. Sulfine pyrazone, remember this thing? This one is like a sulfur thing and inhibits the uric acid reabsorption, that's why we put it here, it will just give you like a distraction. It has some growth in this entire process. Uh, looking into the gout or pseudo gout thing, you see here like there is, for gout you would see like this kind of negative biofringent, it's like more of a straight line CTP type thing. Um, this one is middle shaped, negatively biofringent. Monosodium unit crystals, MSU, it's out. CPD, calcium pyrophosphate, we saw earlier today. Hemochromatosis, you can have this pseudo gout. Mm, you would have like rhomboid shaped. This gives you away, like, okay, it's like done, like, it's not gonna be anything else except CPD. And positively birefringent. Remember the P's they talked about, calcium pyrophosphate crystals. So it's not that difficult to remember. Next question. Uh, basically here in this question, we have a lot of things to talk about. But I would cut it short and I would give you some link here. You can search them, you can study them there as well. See, there's a paper like for the morphological study of kidney stones. This was a question like a 42 year old man the history of recurrent pyelonephritis comes to the office because of a two-day history of left flank pain, fever and chills, temperature is 38.8, appears anxious and is in moderate distress. Physical examination shows left postvertebral angle tenderness exacerbated by percussion. Fine, his urine is cloudy and has a pH of 7.3, CT scan of the abdomen shows large renal calculus, extracorporeal shock. Wave lithotripsy, the ESWL, is done for fragmentation and removal of photomicrograph is shown there. What do you think? Right after I saw this question and I saw the picture, I thought, okay, it's, it's like a gut feeling I had. Okay, it's magnesium ammonium phosphates, stag on calculi. Basically, it is a stag on calculi. But that's not the thing you should learn from this. You have to learn like all other morphologies from here on. And you can see like there are normal crystals which like uric acid, 
calcium oxalate, hippuric acid, calcium phosphate, uh, triple phosphate, calcium carbonate, ammonium or biurate. Then there is this bilirubin, these are the abnormal crystals, cholesterol, cysteine, hexagonal, leucine, tyrosine, sulfa, acyclovir, indinavir. It's very rare to sh this thing being, I mean this thing showing up on the exam. It's going to be rare I guess but still need to be prepared. So calcium oxalate, monohydrate and oxalate dihydrate there are. We will look into the first aid as well. On first aid they have also talked about it. We have notes, we have first aid. We will nail it down here. Calcium oxalate hypocytriduria. You see, like it's radiopath. This one is radiopath. This one is also radiopath. So basically, all of them are radiopath except uric acid, which is radiolucent. Uh, with calcium oxalate, it's associated with hypocytriduria. And the pH is increased in calcium phosphate and ammonium magnesium phosphate because it creates urease, which hydrolyzes and kills off ammonia, which makes the urine a little bit alkaline. See this one, stagon calculi, coffin lit. See this one, calcium phos calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate. Uh, this one is stagon calculi, 16 stones, 16 stones, this one. And D is like rhomboid or rosettes. You need to remember it's uric acid. Like let's suppose the last question we studied. They could have asked like, okay, what kind of thing you would find, what kind of stone you would find, find out like, I mean, they could have given you like all these five pictures and they would have said, look, find out which one is like uric acid crystal. You need to know this thing. You need to know it really nicely. You need to look into a lot more pictures like from the Google, from any resource you have. Uh, the more experience you have basically, the more easier it gets in this exam. Calcium oxalate, you see like it's dumbbell shaped. Calcium oxalate dihydrate, which is monohydrate is dumbbell shaped. Dihydrate is like this envelope shaped. Then calcium phosphate, this one is like prism shaped, like black shaped or wedge shaped. In this picture we have seen like just one of them, okay? We are seeing just one. And here it's like more of a aggregated thing, calcium phosphate associated with hypercalciuria, hypocytriturea. You don't need to study this part a lot because you should follow like the first stage because there are a lot of topics, a lot of controversies about different things. For the steps purpose, these things, if you look into different resources, it's going to be really difficult. Struvite is like coffin lid appearance. Struvite stones. Uric acid. Uh, struvite stone is basically the magnesium ammonium phosphate we're talking about. See this one, magnesium ammonium phosphate, coffin lid appearance. This one, okay, so they didn't give like a uh, calcium phosphate thing at all. Sorry for that, I was wrong in that thing. Mm, cysteine is associated with cystinuria. And yeah. Basically, that's it. It's yellow brown, multiple forms possible. Football shaped, rhomboid shaped, they are saying to look acid. So, look into these things. There is like explanation here, which I don't think so. We need it because we have packed it out. Okay, which of the following pair of drug interferes with DNA synthesis by fast linking? Pretty easy. I wouldn't say that easy because you need to know this thing like what is cross linking, what is DNA interpolation, then like what are the different mechanisms like this cancer drugs work. So, in this case, you can see like the cancer drug here it's basically nucleotide synthesis inhibitors. This one is uh, methotrexate. So it's marked to purine, which decreases the de novo purine synthesis. Hydroxyurea inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. DNA 
at DNA level, uh, the drugs which work are like alkyl eating agents. Now, you need to know like what are the alkyl eating agents. For that, I would say alkyl eating agents are really less in number, like this cyclophosphamide and uh, nitrous ureus. They're the one that there are the alkyl eating agents, and they like they cross links the DNA. That's how they work. One thing to remember for cyclophosphamide is they cross link with the guanin. Nitrous ureus requires prior bioactivation, then it can enter the CNS, which is like they are called like nitrogen mustards, something like that. And vinca alkaloids for cellular division, like and pastitaxel, vinca alkaloids are like they inhibits the microtubule formation, and pastitaxel like inhibits microtubule disassembly. So there has been like mnemonic and first aid where they have said like pastitaxel stabilizes or like taxes stabilizes the society that's how i remembered it it has been almost been easy uh pleomycin dna string dna string breakage very important to remember uh you can have this question about busulfan you need to remember this this one is special in its own yeah, so this thing is important, busulfan, and etoposide, teniposide, and adenotecan, topotecan. Yeah, we know it's topoisomerase, we know this pretty well, but is it one or two? That's where it comes the confusion thing. Okay, this is the last time we're going to have this confusion. Etoposide, topoisomerase 2, how do you remember? It has two sides. Everything has two sides. Etoposide, teniposide, it's topoisomerase too. That's how I remember it. Like like a lame mnemonic for you people, but hope this works for you guys. Then there is this purine and pyrimidine based production pathway we have shown here. Like from ribose, it's being created. One side, like I have CN six MPN as a thiopurine and mycophenolate and riboflavin. This one is IMP dehydrogenase. They inhibit IMP dehydrogenase. Six mercaptopurine. They inhibit de novo purine synthesis. This one is pyrimidine based production. There is leflunamide, which works like inhibit dihydrolate dehydrogenase. This part UMP synthase is inhibit. I mean not inhibited. It's uh, deficient in orotic uh, aciduria. Uh, hydroxyurea inhibits ribonucleotide reductase, increases the um, fetal hemoglobin levels in sickle cell anemia. That's how I remember it always. Bifluorouracil and capacitopine inhibits thymidase synthetase. Methotrexate, trimethoprim, pyrimethamine, all of them inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, but methotrexate inhibits like both prokaryote and eukaryote uh, not prokaryote i guess only eukaryote trimethoprim does it on both pyrimethamine also does it on both so that's how it can cause uh, bone marrow suppression and stuff like that cyclophosphamide associated with myelosuppression siadh fanconi syndrome hemorrhagic cystitis you need to give mesna to bind the sulfhydryl groups of the toxic metabolites Nitrous ureus, you give it in brain tumors. Cyclophosphamide, you give it in case of leukemias, lymphomas, rheumatic disease, and uh, solid tumors, basically. So both of them are like nitrogen mustards. Okay, so basically if we go to the first aid section and uh, if we look into all the drugs they have been talking about, we see them here, like, like this is where like castitaxel, vinfistine, vinblastin, it inhibits the, its polymerization into microtubules. 
capacity taxes mechanism hyper stabilize the polymerized microtubules in the M trees and it's all everything is given. It's procarbazine is an alkylating agent as well, bone marrow suppression, pulmonary toxicity, leukemias, disalkylum like reaction. Gliomycin, you see, it induces free radical formation. It breaks in the DNA strands. So if we go back to our question, see, the gliomycin DNA strand breakage, it induces free radical damage, as well as gliomycin works in the G2 phase. Busulfan, you can see. Busulfan has like kind of same kind of mechanism, but we can see into it. Busulfan mechanism of action. And basically, it's kind of same. Y functional alkylating agent, carbonium ions are rapidly formed, resulting in alkylation of DNA. Anti tumor activity of Busulfan is cell cycle non specific. And basically, it doesn't cause free radical. So the fact is that busulfan, it doesn't induce free radical, it's a non-specific, cell cycle non-specific, cell cycle non-specific alkylating agent, you can remember it this way. Let's go on to the next question. A 55 year old man comes to the physician because of a one year history of progressive shortness of breath, recently retired after 30 years as a construction worker, does not smoke, bilateral, basal or fine, end in respiratory crackles, heart over the lung fields, chest x ray shows diffuse bilateral parenthermal opacities with reticular pattern and bilateral diaphragmatic pleural plaques. It's done here. We have told, talked about pleural plaques, it's about asbestosis. It's a restrictive lung disease in asbestosis. The DLCO is not generally like decreased because DLCO is decreased in any kind of uh, sorry, like the in in restrictive lung disease, DLCO is decreased. Basically, DLCO is decreased in any kind of interstitial lung disease, but it will be normal on extra thoracic conditions such as like polio. So we can go to like the respiratory section and we can check it out there. In the respiratory section, if you go like with pathologies, you would see like restrictive lung diseases and there they are talking about types, poor breathing mechanics, extra pulmonary, normal DLCO, normal AA gradient. Examples would be like polio, myasthenia gravis, GBS, scoliosis, morbid obesity, and all the interstitial lung disease, you see like decrease in DLCO, increase in AA gradient, examples would be pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, silicosis, poor workers pneumoconiosis, sarcoidosis, IPF, wood pasture, Wagner's, eosinophilic granuloma, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and drug toxicities like Gliomycin, Busulfan, Amiodarone, Methotrexate. So the last question, if they have asked about how, what will be the DLCO, it will have been decreased. So the answer here would be D. Answer here is D, and it's pretty obvious. Next question, 47 year old man has a requirement for 10 months, adequate iodine in a diet, no family history, antithyroid peroxidase antibodies are identified. What is it? Hashimoto's. Okay. 
Serum concentration T3, T4 are decreased. TSH is increased. Fine. Which of the following is most likely to involve in the pathogenesis of this disorder? Now, if we, if we look into this thing, uh, like, why is it Hashimoto's we are talking? We understood it is Hashimoto's because it's a woman. It's like in Western country we are talk, talking about goiter, if you think there. It's most likely Hashimoto's in developing countries. It's going to be iron deficiency. That's why like we give iodized salt to people. Like let's suppose in Bangladesh we give that iodized salt. So like now the incidence of goiter has really decreased than previous times. And here like the thyroid gland is like engulfed by lymphocytes and there would be like completely destruction of the thyroid gland at one point so the here the answer would be replacement of the thyroid parenchyma by lymphoid cells and it can ultimately lead to primary hypothyroidism or atrophic thyroiditis at some point uh, from this thing like on ncbi you can look into this thing in ncbi there is a paper on this you can look into that next question is like interesting one uh the answer here is actually fibromuscular dysplasia and we can see the vignette they have talked about 36 year old woman comes to the physician for a follow-up examination one week after being diagnosed with severe hypertension blood pressure is 180 by 120 physical examination shows no other abnormalities a CT scan of the abdomen shows a renal artery aneurysm now you can think about renal artery aneurysm, any aneurysm is most likely associated with atherosclerosis. So we can ride deep into atherosclerotic renal artery disease, but no, you have to look into the picture they have provided you. So the picture they have provided here is like strings of beads appearance, and this is what says this is fibromuscular dysplasia. Uh, why not polyarthritis nervosa? It would have more systemic findings associated with middle-aged men versus women in fibromuscular dysplasia. So basically, wherever you would see like this kind of renal artery stenosis, first thing would be atherosclerosis. Second thing would be fibromuscular dysplasia. And uh, there has been this step two CK stuff like from the U world I've got. Uh, I'm adding it here like clinical features. Like whom would you screen? Any woman less than 50 have resistant hypertension, have an onset of hypertension before 35, sudden increase in blood pressure, creatinine is increased after starting the ACE inhibitors, and systolic diastolic epigastric brewing. Now clinical presentation would be resistant hypertension, cerebrovascular, fibromuscular dysplasia, Horner's syndrome, amaurosis, few guts, transient ischemic attack or like stroke can be the finding. Uh, Non-specific uh, symptoms would be like a headache, pulsatile tinnitus, dizziness from carotid or vertebral artery involvement. It can also involve the iliac subclavian or visceral arteries. Diagnosis, non-invasive testing like CT and geography, duplex, ultrasound. Then we would see like catheter-based digital subtraction imaging uh, if the non-invasive testing is inconclusive. And then we would uh, medically treat the patient and the patient would need follow-up for creatinine and blood pressure every 3 to 4 months and renal ultrasound every 6 to 12 months. Uh, fibromuscular dysplasia is basically in the two-third of the renal artery or segmental branches and it is characterized by loss of internal elastic lamina. There is a loss of internal elastic lamina which can lead to formation of aneurysm due to weakening of the wall. Remember, uh, vasa vesora is basically deficient below the renal artery in the aorta and vasa vesora is there above the renal artery. So uh, basically like if there is atherosclerosis it's less commonly beneath the renal artery it's more more likely like thoracic abdominal aneurysm it happens and then like proximal it can inter it can uh, involve the mediastinum as well which can cause like hemorrhagic mediastinitis or like it can involved even like like the entire aortic root plate which can cause aortic regurgitation and a lot of stuff can happen so you need to keep like a complete uh, picture in your mind what can happen from what next question basically like about here we saw like 
polyarthritis neurosa, it would have basically like fibrinoid necrosis. It's like pan, it's like transmural inflammation of the entire vascular wall, like all media, intima, uh, adventitia, all would be involved in polyarthritis neurosa. Polyarthritis neurosa, we will come into it. There is like polyarthritis neurosa stuff. Mm. Here the question is about a 36 year old woman comes to the physician for a follow up examination one week after being diagnosed with severe hypertension. His blood pressure is 180 by 120. Physical examination shows no other abnormalities. A serious scan of the abdomen shows a renal artery aneurysm. Again, a renal artery aneurysm. A renal angiogram is given. Here you see it's the same question, but basically here we are going to like focus more on polyarthritis neurosa as a case and we will see like what polyarthritis neurosa can cause. This one is from Davidson, 22nd edition. They can show like in polyarthritis neurosa, basically you would have uh, this kind of uh, purpura, non palpable purpura, basically on the lower extremities. Um, there would be peripheral neuropathy, liver reticularis, not non palpable, it's palpable purpura. There would be ulcers, there would be like uh, pain or tenderness in the testes. It can involve the intestine, it can involve the uh, renal artery, it can involve even the cardiac, uh, the coronary arteries. So there would be coronary arteritis, there would be hypertension, renal artery, vasculitis, mesenteric vasculitis causing intestinal angina, and uh, there can be myalgias as well. And CMS involvement is really less common. You can see like it's pretty much the same, like bleeding appearance, it's pretty much the same, but more of like it's like microaneurysm formation in the renal arteries. Uh, it affects the large vessels. Uh, there is a cartoon which depicts the entire thing. See, like this one is transmural inflammation causing fibrinoid necrosis, and this patchy inflammation of all the three layers of the large arteries. Veins are spared. There is no hematuria, and it's associated with hepatitis B for the U.S. only purpose. Hepatitis C and cardiomyopathies. Uh, it can it can occur, but less common. It is less common. Cyclophosphamide and some other chemotherapeutic agents kills the mitotic cells. Now, which of the following cellular comp compartment is most rapidly depleted during cyclophosphamide therapy? So, cyclophosphamide they are talking about whatever it is. It's a chemotherapeutic drug. Remember it always. Lymphocytes are the most sensitive to whole body radiation and granulocytes are more sensitive to chemotherapeutic alkylating agents. So basically lymphopenia would be found if there was radiation involvement. Granulocytopenia would be found when there is uh, basically uh, alkylating agent chemotherapeutic agent being used. Side effect would be poor side effect we saw a few minutes back. SIADH, Fanconi syndrome, hemorrhagic cystitis, bladder cancer, venture with mesna, sulfhydryl group of mesna binds the toxic metabolites and we have to give adequate hydration for that purpose. Next question, a newborn has external genitalia that appear to be male, chromosomal analysis shows a 46 double X karyotype, which of the following is the most likely explanation for the physical findings? Well, this question is a little bit tricky and you need to know some high yield concepts about this question because here like uh, we can see like the newborn she I'm referring her as she because it's 46 double X karyotype now she is looking like a male like what happened here what could have gone wrong okay we can think about okay she has got more testosterone that can be a cause or there might be 5 alpha reductase somehow that might be a cause basically wherever you see like see this thing I have a note here of myself it's like pseudohermaphrodite and true hermaphrodite if it's a male pseudohermaphrodite what happens in pseudohermaphrodite the genotype and phenotype are not the same in true hermaphrodite both genotype and phenotype both are same but there are ambiguous genitalia. so in males you can see like it's xy with 17 alpha hydroxylase in females with a 21 alpha hydroxylase, high testosterone realization. In terms of this woman having hypoplastic fetal adrenal glands, it says it's a congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That's why there is hypoplastic fetal adrenal glands. Another cause of like male pseudohermaphroditism 
is like a complete androgen insensitivity, ambiguous genitalia and antisensitive testis would be there. And uh, there is this, in true hermaphrodite male, there is no like Mullerian inhibitory factor in male. If Mullerian inhibitory factor like is not present in the male, it can cause this ambiguous genitalia, which is a true hermaphrodite. But in case of female, generally you won't find any true hermaphroditism. Uh, there are notes here. We would know, we need to know about this thing called chromatin negative and chromatin positive. So, when more than one chromosome is present, it's like bar bodies are present, which is chromatin positive. Uh, when there is one X chromosome, let's suppose in Turner's or in a normal male 46 XY, it has just one chromosome, so there are no bar bodies there. Uh, there is this uh, disorders of sexual development uh, for males, for females, for sex chromosome disorders. There are a lot of, uh, like, a lot of classifications. Not everything is in need, but I have just kept it for purpose of understanding if you have any problem understanding this thing. It's like, see like there are disorders of gonadal development, which is like complete or partial gonadal dysgenesis, monogenic forms, ovotesticular disorder, syndromic forms, a lot of stuffs are there, not that high yield. For undifferentiated gonads, you need to remember this picture from the first day I have taken it. Uh, from the reproductive section. Uh, if you know this thing, if you master this thing, it's pretty much done. See, one important thing I would like to highlight out here is for external genitalia, the clitoris, labia, and distal vagina, it's stimulated by estradiol. Now, what would be the analogous hormone of estradiol in men? That would be testosterone. But testosterone does here like internal genitalia has the main role. Whereas, Dihydrotestosterone has the main role in forming the external genitalia, which is like the penis, scrotum, and like even the prostate. Prostate is under the control of dihydrotestosterone. That's why we give this 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, like finasteride, to the people who has like this benign prostatic hypoplasia. Uh, plus, many other drugs are given, like androgen receptor blockers, like mycalatomide or flutamide is given to them as well. Even tamsulosin is given. Tamsulosin is like some alpha blocker, you see, like, so internal male genitalia would be like seed, how, that's how we remember seminal vesicles, epididymis, ejaculatory duct, and ductus deferens. If you know, need to know the entire sperm pathway, that would be remembered by that mnemonic, like 7-up, uh, if you remember, there was a mnemonic out there. Let me show you that thing. It's always better to look into like or revise the stuffs whatever you have studied and uh, check it back on your first aid or whatever resources you are using but stick to limited resources that's the key mainly because there are thousands of things you can easily mess up the entire thing if you look at a thousand things So we can see here like the prostate we are seeing here, urethra is there, there is benign prostatic hypoplasia. It's going to compress like it's basically from the lateral and the middle lobe is involved here and urethra can be compressed that would cause like the uh, dynamic problems. There is another one called like static problems. Static problems would be more of like, uh, I mean Static problems would be more of like the ones where you need to do like more of relaxations. So for relaxation purpose, you would give like alpha-1 antagonists such as terazosin, tamsulosin, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, BD5 inhibitors, tardalafil or sildenafil, which you shouldn't give with any kind of uh, vasodilatory substance. You shouldn't give it. It's going to create like really decrease free load, it can lead to like shock 
or even like severe hypertension. hypertension. See the pathway of one, like seminiferous tubules, your two time is vast difference, ejaculatory ducts, N means nothing, U means urethra and penis. And a few minutes back, we have seen into this disorders of sexual development. There is a page in first take when they talk about this thing, like pretty briefly, I would say, not that elaborative discussion here like you can see like disorders diagnosing disorders like if testosterone LH vulva increased defective androgen receptor androgen insensitivity syndrome if testosterone secreting tumor is there it would inhibit like uh, I mean yeah it would inhibit the luteinizing hormone testosterone would be increased hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism hypergonadism is hypergonadotrophic means like uh, luteinizing hormone and FSH and LH are gonadotrophs, so they, they would be increased, testosterone would be decreased. That would be like primary hyper, not, I mean, that is primary because uh, it's gonna, it's uh, testosterone is going to basically inhibit this. It's like completely different of testosterone secreting tumor where it would be increased and luteinizing hormone would be negative feedback by negative feedback it would be inhibited in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism the testosterone and luteinizing hormone both are decreased and other disorders of sex development you will see like this 46 double x dhd and 46 xy whatever we have talked out there 46 double x if you remember what we said out there it was with uh, female what are the problems they do have 21 hydroxylase deficiency is one important thing they have so they have talked about it external genitalia virilized or ambiguous they it can be due to like inappropriate exposure to androgenic steroids which occurs basically in 21 hydroxylase deficiency and which is like congenital adrenal hyperplasia or in case of exogenous administration of androgens during pregnancy and 46 xy dsd it's like the testes are present, but external genitalia are female. It's like androgen insensitivity syndrome they have talked here about. And we have discussed this thing here like as well. Like see, males who do hermaphrodite, one is complete lack. It would be like complete androgen insensitivity and for X1 with ferritin alpha hydroxylase deficiency. Now one thing you need to go and look back at is like this part uh, where like they have discussed about all this thing here you need to know this thing thoroughly eh? every step here ACDH activates this ketoconazole inhibits this uh, it's 17 alpha hydroxylase here two steps aromatase aromatase and 5 alpha reductase plus retinic acid inhibits cortisol to cortisol where cortisol is increased and cortisol would activate the aldosterone which would ultimately cause syndrome of inappropriate mineralocorticoid excess where this step which is like 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase this step is inhibited it's like a genetic deficiency of that enzyme and there is uh, angiotensin 2 activating this and basically that's it you need to know this thing very well if you know it you can answer anything there it's not a problem. We are moving on to the next question and it's as saying this is about talking about men syndrome where there was like an 8 year old boy brought to the physician by his mother 6 days after she noticed a lump on the left side of his neck. 75th percentile for height and weight physical examination showed uh, pectus excavatum 
two millimeters of subcutaneous nodules on the lip was seen and an irregular 2 into 2.5 centimeter mass in the left side of the neck. Anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, 14 year old sister had similar findings at age 10. That means it's the genetic cause. Uh, which of the following studies most likely support the diagnosis? Now, subcutaneous nodules on the lip. Let's suppose I have here like this. This one is the subcutaneous nodules in the tongue, on the lip, wherever it is. Uh, this is basically like uh, you can see this thing in case of men to be where you have mucosal neuromas, oral or intestinal ganglion neuromatosis, medullary thyroid cancer creating this uh, lateral leg, neck mass and there is pheochromocytoma uh, like it hasn't been said out here about pheochromocytoma but maybe the patient has it they haven't uh, said it in the question and uh, associated with marfamide habitus where the patient is seeing like yeah the patient is having like 75 I mean 75th percentile for height and weight, it's a lot. As well as the patient has pectus excavatum, which you can see like in case of uh, marfanoid habitus. See like what are the marfanoid habitus they have talked here about. It's like a constellation of symptoms resembling those of Marfan syndrome, including long, long limbs with an arm span that exceeds the height of the individual and then uh, and a crowded oral maxilla sometimes with high arch in the palate arachnodactyly and hyperlexity and where would you find this multiple habitus in men to be homocystinuria ehlers danlos syndrome type 4 and 3 snyder robinson syndrome and uh, with perol syndrome this next question you can see like it's a question they have said like a patient came for well child examination now the patient can somehow see and now they are asking, okay, how do the patient see, like, where, like, the embryonic fissure, which is, like, incomplete, uh, incompletely closed, where the fissure is, and how did it spare the patient vision. Basically, like, this is known as coloboma, which is a congenital abnormality of the membranes of the eye. It can happen in different places, like the iris, the, the retina, choroids, many places. If it occurs in the iris, which is pretty common, you don't have so much of a possibility except like this disfiguring thing like on your eye when you look or it might even look so cool like you look different but whatever it is uh, you, you would look like this and basically like if if it's present in the retina then only like there would be problems with there would be problems with your I mean, there would be problems with vision. So the answer here would be like the embryonic fissure that is limited to which of the following structures of the left eye is most likely to spare this patient's vision. This patient's vision would be spared in the retina. If it is already involved, your vision wouldn't be spared. Your vision would be like problematic. So that's what they're talking about. Most of the coloboma effect, only the iris, there's no vision loss. If present in retina, there will be vision loss and there can be a number of coloboma which is known as colobomata. It's associated with a number of uh, syndromic, uh, genetic syndromes and can be associated with. It affects less than one in every 10,000 births. Next question, if we look into, it's like they're asking, see like there's a, there's a graph they have saved. They have added amount of Y and amount of X bound to the, I mean, amount of labeled X bound. So an anti is elicited by immunization with protein X and the anti-X antibodies are absorbed to the microtiter wells. The graph shows the amount of the radio labeled protein X bound by the anti in the presence of varying concentrations of protein Y. With respect to the anti-X serum, which of the following interpretation on the epitope expressed by the protein X and Y is correct? Now see, like, if protein and protein X and Y express the same epitopes, it, it would have been a problem, definitely. Now, the answer is basically the protein X and Y have no epitopes in common. And that's how it is, because one is like an antigen, another is like a... Another is uh, like an immunoglobulin and when you have added them you see there is no change it's the flat line 
and if this if this is a flat line completely that means like uh, it's not binding together and that's why they're saying like there is no epitope in common that's why there is no binding and basically there wouldn't be like any effect the amount of y you're going to add doesn't have any effect on the x and you can see like an epitope is also known as an antigenic determinant part of the antigen that is recognized by the immune system specifically by B cells or T cells for example the epitope is the specified piece of antigen to which an antibody bounds because the amount of label X bound is unchanged by the addition of Y they are independent of each other that is they share no epitopes next question pretty easy question 46 year old woman one day history of high grade fever productive cough pleuritic chest pain Laboratory study shows like neutrophils is high, band cells are increased a little bit, leukocyte alkaline phosphate is increased. Now, following, I mean, which of the following finding most likely distinguishes a leukomoid reaction from CML? Now, remember this thing like, wherever there is lap is high, remember it, it's going to be most of the cases, it's going to be leukomoid reaction. And for CML, you need to have BCR ABL translocation. You need to have basophils and uh, like leukocyte alkaline phosphatase is like pretty low in malignant neutrophils versus benign neutrophilia where lap is increased uh, where you can have you can have like infections medication or severe hemorrhage so here the answer would be b leukocyte alkaline phosphate activity greater than 250. Uh, this is a biostat question it was a little bit of, uh, not that difficult, but a little bit tricky. It's like a cohort study is conducted to examine the association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer in a sample of 4,000 people. 1,000 participants smoke cigarette and 3,000 participants do not smoke. After 10 years of follow-up, there are 30 cases of lung cancer among smokers, 30 cases of lung cancer among the non-smokers. According to this results, how many lung cancer cases attributable to smoking would be expected to occur in a group of 10,000 smokers over the same period of time? Okay, so this question, they are here asking about uh, like the attributable risk and uh, they are talking clearly here about like the attributable to smoking cases which are attributable to smoking. In order to find them out. Now attributable risk we know incidence in exposed minus incidence in unexposed. Here the exposed 30 people out of 1000 smokers, 30 out of 3000 non-smokers. See like 4000 people were there, 3000 people did not smoke. So 30 out of them got cancer who did not smoke. So the incidence in unexposed is 30 by 3000 and 1000 people out of them did smoke that means because there are 4,000 in total 3,000 did not smoke means 1,000 did smoke so 30 by 1,000 0.03 by minus 0.01 which gives 0.02 which is an attributable risk of 2% now if you apply this to this population they have asked you in the last uh, sentence how many lung cancer cases attributable to smoking would be expected to occur in a group of 10,000 smokers so applying this 2% to 10,000 smokers, it would be 200 people. And there is like this another one attributable risk. We have given it like you can also find it out this way. A by A plus D minus C by C plus D relative risk minus 1 divided by relative risk into 100. Next question, if you see, it's really difficult. This one is like it's one in hundred would be able to answer this, I guess. Uh, I mean, I couldn't answer this properly when I was solving this thing. It was really difficult for me, but then kind of it made sense. There is like increased venous lactate, increased mitochondrial mitochondrial uh, in case of like more which is like myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers. There is basically, it's a mitochondrial disease and it begins in the childhood. Bronchiolitis may occur in the adulthood. You can see like myoclonus, brief sudden 
twitching of the muscle spasm, painful involuntary muscular contraction, seizures, attachia, red, ragged fibers. See, there are red, ragged fibers and scattered red, ragged red muscles in the Gomori trichum stain. This one, you use like Gomori trichum stain for like mitochondrial myelopathies or to find out mitochondrial inclusions and stuff. Here you can see like uh, the venous lactate is increased, maximum oxygen consumption is decreased and energy production by glycolysis is increased. It's pretty difficult like the explanation here. Uh, basically like with MARC you would have like a, uh, there is a like mutation in the tRNA in the MARC. So if there is a mutation in the tRNA, it disrupts the mitochondrial protein synthesis in simple terms I'm trying to explain here, it disrupts the mitochondrial protein synthesis and basically for that reason it causes uh, decreased activity of the complex 1 and to lesser extent complex 4 and it decreases respiration and lowers the proton pumping dramatically decreasing the membrane potential. Now if the membrane potential is uh, dramatically decreased for some reason then proton electrochemical potential gradient across the mitochondrial inner membrane would also be decreased and the gradient is the driving force for ATP synthesis and decreasing it substantially lowers the maximal rate of ATP synthesis. So it's basically a very complex thing it's associated with that respiratory chain and there like with respiratory chain you can see like there is this concept which is like this maximum oxygen consumption VO2 which is uh, basically like the maximum amount of uh, oxygen you can extract uh, like I mean you can extract uh, when you are like switching from aerobic to anaerobic respiration and this one is like this would occur faster because there would be overall more cellular respiration occurring meaning the body would switch to anaerobic and utilize glycolysis to lactate for energy and stop utilizing the mitochondria and thus the VO2 max would decrease here. So a little bit of a difficult question. This one is quite an easy question like they are talking about which one of the vaccines most appropriate to prevent mumps and mumps is basically like we know like it's a it's it's a killed back I mean it's it's a live attenuated vaccine and mumps is like a virus paramyxo virus so it should be like live attenuated virus they should say that's the answer here now it has it has like this inactivated virus and live attenuated virus uh, we can look into this thing, like if you go like into the Kaplan and if you look into like Kaplan immunology, in the Kaplan immunology they have talked about it pretty, pretty well, I should say. It's pretty much like the best one you can find out there in terms of vaccination schedule, remembering them and Understanding them really deeply, we need to study like it in the Kaplan. You can see it, there is a chart here in Kaplan, but they have explained here. Like, see, like most of the RIPA we saw here, RIPA. Uh, this one is all the killed vaccine, this is the mnemonic, and the rest are basically like either inactivated or like live attenuated, something like this. And with the measles, you see, like it's a live attenuated vaccine we are talking about so yeah and so here the answer would be like live attenuated virus it should be next question we're moving into like there is a man who came for health maintenance examination just for a routine health maintenance examination, it's not like he's really ill or something. So he had smoked one pack of cigarette daily for 30 years, he quit 3 years ago. Physical examination shows a painless white patch in the lateral border of the tongue. Now whenever you find something in the lateral border of the tongue, you have to understand, okay, is it like oral hearing leukopathia? 
that's what it comes like this one. See, like over here, click here. Yeah. And this one is right to click here. Yeah. This one is verrucous nucleic. Yeah. Number of types of nucleic. Yeah. They're ulcerative, spectral, the nodular, homogeneous. But remember this: it's a normal person, and nucleic yeah, is precancerous lesion of a squamous cell. It can be in normal person, and it first invades to the basement membrane of the cell mucosa. But oral here in nucleic, yeah, this thing. It's always associated with immunocompromised people. And plus, cigarette smoking is a risk factor for this leukoplechia, where with oral hearing leukoplechia, it is not much. So, you need to understand this thing, and remember this thing very well. And with hearing leukoplechia, what you would see, like, there would be like white confluent patches of fluffy hairy mucosa bilateral along the lateral tongue, and associated with HIV positive patients, which is like it in AIDS patient, it may appear within two three years, and this is one of the like highlighting features of like AIDS. It's an AIDS defining illness, and the histology would be like something. There would be hyperkeratotic oral mucosa, the piling of the keratotic squamous cell, and there would be right type A inclusions, balloon cells in the margination of chromatin and Epstein-Barr virus will be present in the spinal layer okay and there will be variable cholecystosis, superimposed candida infection without inflammatory response so this balloon cells is very important and uh, this thing you see here like the leukoplakia the leukoplakia you can find this thing in uh, robins I can have seen in the robins Basically, Robbins is really a nice book, uh, which has like almost uh, everything you need to know, and it's so vast. That's true, but still, it's like pretty fascinating to know Robbins and study Robbins. You can learn a lot of pathologies. Uh, Pathoma is gold. There is no doubt about it. But Pathoma has like. I mean, if you need to know it really nicely, I would say that like, Robbins is the best. I mean, there is nothing close to Robbins. There is nothing close to Robbins. So, you can see it here. Here they're talking about the molluscum contagious infection. Uh, this is if you're self injectors. So, okay, this they will be talking here about the leukoplakia in the vagina and the vulva. Basically, this leukoplakia is our. See, leukoplakias and isoplakias are oral mucosal lesions that may undergo malignant transformation. And this is the progression of the disease, like in normal, in hyperplasia, hyperkeratosis, in mild moderate dysplasia, to severe dysplasia, and that's not so carcinoma. This one is like leukoplakia. See, like leukoplakia would look like this. And our question, it also looks like this. So it's like it seems like it's the same thing they have put over there. The histologic appearance of leukoplakia showing severe dysplasia characterized by nuclear and cellular pleomorphism. There is nuclear and cellular pleomorphism. Numerous mitotic figures are there, and there is a loss of normal maturation. Remember this. This is leukoplakia. This is erythroplakia. And if you know, this is pyogenic granuloma. This is aphthous ulcer. And I'm trying to find out like the oral here. They have. Uh, 
that in some way is the Shukti Bhagavad Sangha. This is called a cell carcinoma. You can see, like, it demonstrates numerous nests and islands of malignant keratinocytes invading the underlying connective tissue stroma and the skeletal muscle. It's called a cell carcinoma. Very dangerous thing. Let's move on to the next question we have. It's about a 35-year-old woman has traced urinary incontinence with sphincter incompetence. A pelvic floor muscle exercises, the use of vaginal pessary provide in, in inadequate improvement and the patient refuses surgical intervention. Administration of a drug with which of the following mechanism of action is uh, most appropriate. Now this one is like we know like there's only now a lot of receptors working in the urethra. You can see just there is only one receptor in urethra that works and that is the alpha 1 receptor. So you can either stimulate or you can like inhibit this. So why are we stimulating this receptor here? You can see. Phenyl propylamine is alpha agonist that stimulates urethral smooth muscle contraction and it is from up to date. It also says it is not recommended treatment anymore according to up to date. And here is like we are showing like the entire micturition reflex and clinical features and treatment of different types of lesions along this pathway. See, like the pelvic nerve and the polymeric supply to the M3 receptors. There is hypogastric nerve, which is like kind of this one is the point, this is squeeze, it means like sympathetic shoot, somatic, pudental nerve. This one is acetylcholine, this one is also norepinephrine, this one is acetylcholine as well. And basically, the pelvic splanchnic nerves carry the sensory input. The blood is stretching and parasympathetic different to contract the detrus of muscles, pelvic splanchnic nerves. And think about the pelvic splanchnic nerves, afferent input from bladder, stretching the parasympathetic different to contract the detrus of muscle. Hypogastric. It carries the sympathetic effect the internal sphincter relaxation. So urine can pass. This one is by the hypogastric nerve. Pudendal nerve carries the somatic innervation to the external sphincter, which is voluntarily controlled. So anywhere, if you have lesion anywhere, let's suppose you have a lesion in the. Uh, it's like there are like two centers for the micturition reflux. One is like the pontine center. Okay, and another is like for the reflex arc. Uh, if the pontine center is somehow gone, this one would be like hyper contracted. There would be like hypertonic upper motor neuron lesion, periodontal tract lesion, neurodivergence with arch incontinence, blood sphincter incoordination, incomplete bladder emptying. You have to give anticholinergics, which works here and here as well. There will be like solifenacin, toltoridine. Uh, there would be like imipramine, intermittent self catheterization. If it's a cortical stroke, cortical stroke means the frontal, post central, pre central, which involves like the cortical areas of the bladder. Uh, it can also cause like neurogenic bladder. And it can be lower motor neuron lesion, which would be like some kind of like a lower motor neuron lesion. Uh, there would be loss of contraction and stuff. Uh, the thing, I mean, the entire bladder would be filled with urine. There would be like uh, kind of like an urinary incontinence, which is not arch incontinence, it's overflow urinary incontinence. It would be, and there would be lesion of the cecal roots and nerves, lesion of the cecal segments of the cord, pumas medullaris. The treatment would be intermittent self catheterization, indwelling catheterization, and See, there's a thing they have said, if the cervical 
of thoracic spinal cord is severed, the higher brain will lose its control. And when the higher brain loses its control, the bladder becomes hyperreflexive. That's what we are talking about. It's not just like brain segment, anything above the sacral spinal segment, you would have like hyperreflexion. So it has a center at the sacral level and then it forms as well. Next question we are looking like a female newborn develops respiratory distress, respirations are 80, uh, there was poor prenatal care, physical examination shows uh, intercostal retractions, uh, chest x ray shows multiple reef fractures, and skeletal x ray shows multiple papillary long bones at various stages of healing. It gives up the answer. This is osteogenesis imperfecta. Now, there are different types of osteogenesis imperfecta we can see. Like type 1, 2, 3, 4. This is from Robbins. Type 1 is like it's compatible with life. Type 2 is like perinatal, it's lethal, it's really bad. Type 2. And you can see like number of fractures, number of fractures. This one happens in type 2. Type 3 is also pretty bad. Type 4 is fine, like they can live. And there are a number of places where this entire collagen defect can happen. It's all about like the collagen defect. And if there is a collagen defect, you wouldn't have like this kind of uh, trabecally and the osteoid wouldn't be produced that well compared to normal. So you would have like, the replacement of the bone with the regular immature uh, woven bone and increase in number of osteocytes and osteoblasts and osteoid non-mineralization. Uh, you can see that there are types of cartilage, basically type 1 collagen is deficient in osteogenesis imperfecta. In type 2 it's basically the cartilage, this is how I remember. Type 3 is like 3D, like Ehlers-Danlos. Type 4 is like the good pasture syndrome. Type 3, you need to remember the reticle in skin, blood vessels. Type 3. Type 1 is basically bone, skin, tendons, this thing. Type 4 is basement membrane. You know this thing. And it's the genetic defect in cola 1 or cola 2. And there can be hearing loss, there can be, I mean, dental imperfectogenesis, something like this. There was there. So there will be like loose clara, very characteristic of osteogenesis imperfecta. There would be like multiple fractures as well. And see like how the uh, the bone, the entire bone has lost its integrity inside. In case of osteogenesis imperfecta. Okay. Next question is about P, positive end pressure, positive end expiratory pressure. So what happens there for P we need to remember whenever you're giving P P C like Generally, our uh, entire breathing mechanics is based on this negative pressure ventilation. Whenever there is negative pressure, we inflate, we inspire. But in, in case of deep patients, in this case, where like a 22-year-old man was brought to the emergency department 30 minutes after, found, after a friend found him unconscious on the floor, a drug overdose is suspected, pulse is 120, respirations are really low, 4, really bad condition. Blood pressure is 120 by 100, pulse pressure is really low, and there is mild cyanosis intubated, mechanically ventilated, and positive pressure ventilation started with 10 centimeters of water. Uh, then, like, which of the following set of best findings describes the effects of mechanical ventilation? Basically, like, what happens in since uh, you were not able to, like, they're talking here about basically this patient has been suffering ARDS for any reason, whatever it is. Uh, so they cannot keep their alveoli recruited anymore. It collapses whenever they are expiring. So they're providing a pressure artificially so that it doesn't collapse. Plus, there is like uh, in mechanical ventilation, there is this auto peak they call where like the machine triggers itself the expiration and as a result you can have like a little bit of gas exchange but for prolonged time this is bad this is not going to solve anything for prolonged time uh, in ARDS basically if you start peak earlier and it has good prognosis definitely and you can see like with 
deep, you would like decrease the caliber of the vessel. If the caliber of the vessel is decreased due to any reason, whatever it is, uh, there would be like an increase in dead space that would have like a BQ mismatch and ultimately like there wouldn't be like BQ mismatch, uh, I mean the BQ mismatch wouldn't follow like certain grooves from the apex to the base and the ultimate problem would be like at some point since you are not contracting the diaphragm anymore uh, there wouldn't be increase, there wouldn't be like a good amount of uh, venous return the mean arterial pressure would increase and since the mean arterial pressure increases the uh, right ventricular afterload would increase and there will be like pulmonary vascular resistance would increase that can lead to pulmonary edema as well and it, this can lead to decreased supply to the left heart there will be decreased uh, decreased preload and in, in uh, there will be like decreased preload and there would be an increase in afterload basically generally during spontaneous breathing but here it doesn't happen there are types of uh, mechanical ventilation i have taken it from the uh, davidson you can see this thing there is there are invasive procedures as well as non-invasive the invasive ones are like invasive positive pressure ventilation another is an NPPV non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is the uh, like also known as BiPAP. Uh, there is BiPAP, you can see. Uh, BiPAP is generally given in case of patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Not obstructive sleep apnea, sorry, CPAP is given in obstructive sleep apnea. Basically. And there are like different modalities, like where the volume can be controlled, pressure can be controlled, tidal volume can be controlled, and, and mixed. Uh, mixed modalities are there as well. So the potential complications would be like over distended alveoli causing barotrauma, uh, decreased venous return, increased right ventricular afterload, decreased mismatch. They have talked about it there. And you see, like P or CPAP would increase the compliance, decreases the work of bleeding, increases the post procedural capacity, decreases shunt, increases pressure pressure of arterial oxygen. Uh, low peep is like 3 to 5 centimeters, therapeutic is better than 5 and you can see it like in mild ARDS it should be better than 5 which is a therapeutic mortality itself and with moderate it should be like partial pressure of arterial oxygen to the uh, inspiratory oxygen the ratio should be less than 200 and if it is less than 100 it is severe ARDS I need to give peep with greater than 10 centimeters, or 10, greater than or equal to 10 centimeters of water. You can see here, like, if if there is no negative pressure and you are giving positive pressure, the pressure would transmit to the pleura as well. The pleura would, the interpleural pressure would stay positive, and basically, like you can see here, generally in normal terms, while inspiration it goes up, then while expiration it goes. I mean. It goes again down, then it again goes up, then it again goes down. But in this case, it's not happening. It's what what happening here is like since the intrapleural pressure is positive here as well, so like it doesn't go back to the negative domain at all. It stays positive all the way, and that's why the answer is like uh, the peak inspiratory pressure, the intidal pressure, or the peak inspiratory intrapleural pressure, intidal intrapleural pressure. Everything remains positive in this case. Uh, there is no, you can like look into it. I would try to provide a link to all of this. I'm not sure if I would be able to, uh, but uh, hopefully I will provide a link of all these things I'm explaining today so that you can download and you can like read at your free time, understand everything, every detail out of it. Uh, next question we move on to. There is a three month old girl is brought to the physician by her parents because of a two month history of an enlarging red spot on her abdomen. Basically, this was like an offline version, so uh, they missed the picture there. So, this was the picture given. What is it? If you are really like proficient in solving questions, you know it right away. This is strawberry hemangioma, uh, which is like strawberry hemangioma is like some hemangioma, which is a tumor of like blood vessels and the answer would be densely packed capillaries where like 
in the capillaries you would see like this kind of picture where there would be like lobules separated by thin septa for being clusters of thin walled capillaries and the capillaries are lined by single layer of endothelium which is itself a capillary. This can be a picture of strawberry hemangioma. Uh, arterioles in the fibrous stroma doesn't make any sense. Arteriovenous malformations. It can occur like in the in internal viscera and many other parts. Uh, it wouldn't look like this, but there would be venous component as well and arterial component. This is capillary field surely it looks like. Plus it's a it's a male. Uh, there is another thing called nevus flenius where you would see like the entire one portion of the uh, one portion of the face or any portion of the body or trunk. It would like be really like reddish in color and it's flamey hot it looks like so it started as like this like nevus flenius and like I, I don't know like the pathologists they always have this analogy to food or like food type things. So they name it like that way, like nevus flinius. Then the next one is like cavernous vascular spaces. This would be seen like in case of cavernous hemangioma. If you go into like the robins, you can see these things out there. It's a nice book and it's really good for uh, developing your skills in pathology, seeing like slides and everything it would help it, it helps a lot basically see this one like the blood filled vascular channels separated by dense fibrous stroma uh, this one is basically like they were talking here about focal nodular hypoplasia it's like it's not nodular hypoplasia it's like a hemangioma of the liver basically and uh, we'll look into like actual cavernous hemangioma. There's actually cavernous hemangioma even in the liver. You know. uh, if you find it out, you can go like to this. This blood vessels, you know, amongst this blood vessel is vascular structure function. Inside that, you will find out all the types of vascular things you need to know. See, like they're showing here, heart hiding arteriosclerosis. And there is this hypoplastic arteriosclerosis. Hiding arteriosclerosis, you would see it in, in case of uh, malignant hypertension. And this one, you would see like in, like you would see this kind of thing in chronic hypertension, basically, like the uh, urgency. You see, like the hypertensive uh, emergency. This one, you would see it with. Uh, Basically, uh, really high blood pressure, you know, defibrillary necrosis all around. This is the onion skinning, basically, onion skinning. That is strict. See, like, foam cells are there. slowly moving towards our vascular tumors which is the one here at the vascular this you can see this thing here E is known as the mangium of the tongue this one is like juvenile Capillary hemangioma, like the strawberry hemangioma we are we were talking about. See, like they are like thin walled blood vessels in very like congested space. And this one is like there are vascular sinusoids all around, like the stroma, fibrous stroma. This one is cavernous hemangioma, and uh, this one you can see here is pyogenic granuloma of the lip. 
So, yeah, that's it basically. And like, there is this Kapuchi circle, oh, we have shown it before. It's, it's on the lower extremities, and you will find like a lot of uh, it's a sarcoma, you find a lot of lymphocytes here, nodular stage. And you see, there are like red, purple macros and plaques on the skin, histologic appearance, and nodular stage. Sheets of plump, proliferating spindle cells. In case of Bartonella hensili, that's how you need to, I mean, in vascular angiomatosis, that's what is very important to distinguish it from. In vascular angiomatosis, it would be like a characteristic cutaneous region like this. Associated with uh, Bartonella hensili, there is another one, Bartonella quintana, which is associated with trench fever. And the histologic appearance here, it would show you like, um, basically like in, in Bacillary angiomatosis, you would have neutrophilic infiltrate and it's not from the endothelium, the entire thing. It's like there's like vascular proliferation only and neutrophilic infiltration. Whereas in uh, Kakushi sarcoma, you would have like his lymphocytic infiltrate and like the entire tumor is from the endothelium. Next question we move on to is like a 44 year old woman graduated to para 2 culture division, health maintenance examination, physical therapy examination shows no abnormalities, results of Pashmir shows discussed columnar ciliated cells. If patients were healthy, columnar cells seen in the patient's Pashmir would most likely originate from which of the following areas? Well, like they showed columnar cells. It's a pretty giveaway here. It's going to be cervical canal, the answer. Why not endometrium? Well, like endometrium has this uh, columnar cells as well, but it's less likely. Like they're, I mean, really talking about Pashmir taken from the cervical canal. It's not taken from the endometrium, as well as the like, endometrium doesn't have that risk of like cervical cancer. Uh, endometrial cancer is itself a different entity. It has different types of risk factors. Different things are associated with it. And uh, posterior fornix of the vagina doesn't make sense. The vaginal portion of the cervix or the vaginal vestibule doesn't make sense. It's like there can be vestibular cancer or like um, vulvar cancer, this kind of thing. Those are also associated with HPV, a lot of them like vulvar cancers. But uh, what can happen is like from cervical canal, the cervical cancer can spread to this places. I mean, by metastasis to the adjacent organs or adjacent portions. Uh, which of the following best explains okay. which of the following best explains impaired action potentials in the affected axons in patients with demyelinating diseases? Okay, so with demyelinating diseases, you need to understand like this picture here, uh, where like you're shown like this myelin sheet. You need to know this thing. There is this um, there is this thing like they they talk about it where like the speed of conduction velocity to talk about it would be like this it would be lambda d by lambda t so basically this thing this is like length constant this is like the time constant and this thing doesn't apply out here but we can see this kind of questions if like the length constant is increased the conduction velocity is also increased if time constant is decreased conduction velocity is decreased but here they're talking about the myelin sheet and in case of a demyelinating disease the myelin sheet is gone and what would happen like charge from here to here there would be like a lot of charge can come off here the capacitance here would is now decreased when more charge can come off the capacitance would be increased so increased capacitance means like there is more anions along the surface and it will attract more cations and less cations will be available to depolarize the parts of the membrane 
and more cations would be available in this case yes. so that's how like the conduction velocity would work yeah. so which of the following best explains impaired action potential and the action potential would be impaired in case of increase in axonal capacitance a 70 year old man with severe congestive heart failure has a progressive orthopnea for past four weeks he has not been taking his medications during this time his urine output has progressively decreased to 300 which of the following sets of laboratory findings is most likely they have talked about um, this one is like there is congestive heart failure history history of congestive heart failure that means there is some problem like sending blood to the renal artery that can lead to like pre renal causes of AKI since this entire like uh, finding they have given here this is because you, they have given you to find out okay is it like pre renal, renal or post renal acute kidney injury and you would have to find out that way like you know like for pre renal uh, the one is to like the serum run urea nitrogen is to serum creatinine ratio would be greater than 20 because in pre renal uh, you are creating a lot of blood urea nitrogen but you are not able to excrete them but the creatinine is leaving creatinine cannot stay in the body they are living so that's why the serum bonds to creatinine ratio is going to be increased and that should be greater than 20 now greater than 10 to 20 there are a lot of them fine uh, what is the ratio 20 by 2 10 30 by 2 15 40 by 2 it's going to be 20 just only one is going to be 20 and you don't even need to know these things but for like for other question solving you need to definitely know this because they're not going to put out just only one variable out here they will mess up with, with every variable possible they will i don't know like the test takers or test uh writers whoever writes it they have like such a complex mind they would find out so many complex things and they would make your life hell definitely so the urinary sodium generally should be in case of uh, pre renal it like the sodium cannot even go there so it won't be lost it should be less than one percent and here one percent would be like one percent of normal serum sodium concentration which is like 145 milli equivalents so one percent would be like um I mean less than 1% we talk about uh, it should be 14.5 so less than 14.5 here just there is only this one and this one and if you don't have like enough of sodium going into the uh, into the filtrate so the urine that would be created and the osmolarity of the urine what would be well you are not sending out a lot of urine and you are not sending out even sodium so water won't even go there you wouldn't have that much water on the urine and for that reason the specific gravity would increase so here the correct answer would be D in this question you can see like a 44 year old man with an invasive pancreatic cancer brought to the emergency department because of two week history severe right sided back and abdominal pain. The patient states that he has had a 6.8 kg weight loss during the past month. A physical examination shows no abnormalities and operation is scheduled to relieve the pain. The most likely target of pain relief in which of the following label size in the photograph of a mild and stained cross section of the spinal cord shown. So this question is talking about a two week history of the right sided back and abdominal pain. It's the right sided thing and the patient states that he has had a 6.8 kg weight loss. Okay, they're talking about weight loss right now. Since it's a cancer, it's a distractor right now. Don't need to worry about it. Physical examination shows no abnormalities in operation is scheduled to relieve the pain. Now, the pain is relieved, but how would you relieve it? And what would be the target of that pain reliever? Well, that pain reliever can only work. We know like the pain is being carried by the spinal thalamic tract for the body. And for the face, it's like this uh, it's like the mesencephalo trigeminal tract. I mean, by the tri spinal trigeminal nucleus for the face, 
and that is uh, generally from the ipsilateral side. So you can find this thing, ipsilateral pain loss in the face, contralateral pain loss in the opposite side of the body, I mean contralateral pain loss of the body or the trunk, thalopisthesis in lateral medullary syndrome, this is how I remember it. Uh, I was just saying an extra thing, it's, it has nothing to do with this question though. Uh, this question is just about like like uh, pain and temperature sensation from the contralateral trunk of the body and for the contralateral trunk of the body you need to know like it comes from this place is only D or C. Now it's on the right side and the pain is on the right side and we know like when it comes it goes like right away like from the uh, from the pre nerve endings it comes and it uh, decussates onto the dorsal groove on like the dorsal I mean on the dorsal portion of the spine from there to like the dorsal root ganglia process and uh, it will come it would be like this uh, it would come it would cross like the if this is like the It would come like this, it would take a seat right away and it would start going up. So this one is like the spinal thalamic tract. Like this spinal thalamic tract. And spinal thalamic tract is like it crosses right away. So it should be like G. It should be on the opposite side. The answer here is definitely G. This is the spinal column. So we need to do a draw with a mouse. Next question: A 40-year-old man has an enlarging breast tissue. There is an enlargement of the breast tissue we are talking about for the past three months. Taking a diuretic six months ago. Which of the following drugs most likely cause this adverse effect? Well, amongst all this thing, it's a very easy question. Amongst all of them. None of them basically causes any kind of uh, gynecomastia except uh, spinal lactam. And they haven't talked about diuretic. You can think, okay, all of them are diuretics basically. The only diuretic that causes gynecomastia is spinal lactam. It was an easy question. A 35 year old woman comes to the physician with a six month history of uh, intermittent fever, fatigue, unexplained weight loss. She has had 18 kg weight loss during this period. Six month history of intermittent fever. You need to remember this thing. There is fever, there is fatigue, and there is unexplained weight loss. And uh, she has had 18 kg. That's a huge, huge amount of weight loss to take here. Uh, temperature is 37.2, which is normal somehow. Uh, laboratory studies show CD4 T lymphocyte count of 60, really less. HIV viral load of 6 lakh. It's really grave situation here. And uh, now, what would be like the steps of viral replication? And uh, the treatment the patient would be given, they will target like the steps of viral replication. Well, like in case of HIV, we know there can be a lot of drugs that can be given, like fusion inhibitors, there is this Maravira, and a lot of things. So if we go into the question section, and we look into that thing, can see it here like uh, in the antiviral section in first rate we have almost everything and you can see it where uh, for HIV antiviral therapy there is attachment is paragraph inhibits that penetration inhibitors or enfibrotide enterprise inhibitors like this causes it to CK creatinine kinase and stuff like that adverse effects uh, dolutegravir, pitogravir and valtegravir NRTIs and NRTIs, uh, all of them are like nucleosides, these are non-nucleosides. Only one nucleotide is there and that one is kenophobia. You need to remember that. Uh, protease inhibitors are like atazanavir, daranavir, kosamprinavir. All navirs are going to be like protease inhibitors. And this one is like for other antivirals. Now for HIV therapy, generally what do we do? We started with like this, two NRTIs and preferably an 
integrase inhibitors. So it should be NRTIs we're talking, we're talking about. And NNRTIs, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for HIV-1. NNRTIs are given in HIV-2, basically. So here in this case, like, where are they targeting? Like, if it, if it binds with the nucleoside, and from the nucleoside, it can ultimately form the DNA, so the synthesis of viral DNA is going to be targeted here. So that's the answer. Other one, disruption of viral receptors. Yeah, you can you can give it, but it's not the right away. The first drug you should be given an HIV patient. It is given like in more advanced cases. And uncoating, it's like generally for normal viruses. You can see here, uncoating is by the amantadine, amantadine. This thing, this drugs work with uncoating thing. Let's see it here. Okay, I guess they have like already like taken off that drug from here for the new 2019 section of first aid or whatever like uh, I'm quoting this by Amantidine and Dramantidine release of vital particles from the cell I don't know like if there is any drug but yeah release can be like inhibited by like uh, the neuraminidase inhibitors like Oseltamivir and Xanamivir Next question, we move on to 78 year old man is found unresponsive in his ear by a neighbor. Paramedics arrive and begin resuscitation. 25 minutes later, he regains a stable cardiac rhythm. He brought to the emergency department. Mechanical ventilation is initiated. Temperature is 36.4. Pulse is normal. Respirations are normal. With spontaneous respiratory efforts, blood pressure is a little bit low, 98 by 60. Remains unresponsive. Admitted to the hospital, neighbor says he always had say he wouldn't like to be kept on life support if he was no hope of if there was no hope of recovery. His wife died five years ago and I have been cooking for him, helping him with rent since then. Uh, the patient has no children and close relatives. The physician believes that the patient has sustained significant anoxic brain injury and his prognosis is poor. Now it is most appropriate for the physician to state to the neighbor which of the following. Now, the physician, which one should he like see? Now, your answer you should choose always the answer which seems perfect to you. I know there are a lot of controversies regarding ethics questions where, like, you would like, I don't know, you you should follow this rule, that rule. There are a lot of rules, a lot of things, ethics, you can study it for one month, it wouldn't even finish, you wouldn't get some random shit like in the exam. But my my way of solving ethics is kind of like, okay, find out the most appropriate answer, find out the most peaceful answer, find out the most, I mean, find out the nicest of the answers. And basically that's what actually answers turn out to be in the end and don't choose any answer which where the physician or the patient would uh, seem or sound cocky to you or even like rude anything like that nothing just find out the nicest one and here the nicest one to me i guess was thank you for telling me this uh, your friend's previous statements to you can be helpful in making decisions for him the other one there was another thank you thing thank you for your concern but since you are not a relative, it sounds so rude. And you you can like rule out all the answers if it sounds out rude. And only see like actually like sounded like a real gentleman kind of sentence or phrase. So that's why I guess C is the answer. And C is actually the answer. I've seen it like in different reviews and in different forums. A 60 year old man has had easy fatigability, then loss of appetite and significant weight loss over the past three months. Routine blood studies show a marked increase in serum calcium concentration. Radiographic examination does not show bone metastasis. The patient is most likely to have cancer of each of the following organs they're talking about. It's pretty easy, like there's nothing to like study from here, I guess. It's like lung. None of them basically thyroid gland. It would cause you cancer, but 
I mean, if there is thyroid gland cancer, it can go to the bone. Lung cancer can also go to the bone, it's true. But the thing is like lung cancer, it has like almost a lung carcinoma. To be more like precise, I would say. Squamous cell lung carcinoma. It's associated with parathyroid hormone related peptide. This thing it stimulates osteoblasts and ultimately like osteopaths stimulate osteoclasts, stimulates in turn like TGF beta and calcium, which uh, stimulates the parathyroid hormone related peptide expression in a vicious cycle and it goes to the kidney and causes more of calcium reabsorption. So the answer would be B. Uh, next question is really like a little bit of annoying. It's like they expected us to know this thing, and plus it's pretty. It pretty much makes sense. Like because the patient had like uh, triglyceride. You see, like triglyceride. Its concentration is three fifty. That's huge. That's a lot of amount. And that would ultimately cause pancreatitis and uh, familial hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, it's really dangerous. And you should give like gem fibrosil. There is a way to find out actually why you shouldn't give statins because statins also decrease triglyceride. But the best one for it decreasing triglyceride is always gem fibrosil or phenofibrate, you can call. Like the fibrate group of drugs are better for like triglycerides. And you can see like the VLDLC, you can uh, like the, by this Friedwald equation, you can find out like this VLDLC is triglyceride by 5. And LDLC is total cholesterol minus HDL minus VLDL. And basically, that VLDL you can like substitute the equation here, triglyceride by 5. And by that, we will find out actually like the LDL here. LDL would be basically. Thing, which is like okay, it's fine, it's not like that. So, in that sense, you can like uh, in that sense, you can think okay, like okay, studying, you don't need to give it. Uh, I would I'll just show you, I guess, this thing is important to notice and see this. Uh, familial chylomicronemia, you can get pancreatitis, pruritus, eruptive xanthomas, hypercholesterolemia, you would have increased uh, LDL cholesterol, 1 LP, 2 LB, 3 with E, 4 gets more, this is how I remember, like the familial dyslipidemias, there was like a mnemonic I saw like in Dr. USMLB, and it really helped me a lot. And here you would get, you can see like uh, familial hypertriglyceridemia, Better than 1,000, it can cause pancreatitis. If you don't, if you don't like intervene right now, it can go out of control and can be really, really difficult in future. Next question, we would move on to. This is about vaccination. Uh, they just asked here, like, which one you should give, like, with a uh, girl who came, like, from rural region of China, and. Uh, he, he he emigrated from there. He received no medication. He was here for a well child examination. So basically, in six months, what are you gonna give? Like amongst all these vaccinations, only hepatitis. That's it. And basically, that's what they give. Like hepatitis is given. Like the hepatitis B, and hepatitis B is associated with mm, like. Hepatitis B is very common, like in Asia, in that part of the world. You can see like the B and T cell mediated immunity. In B cell, it just induces the humoral T cell cellular immunity, but if you conjugate something with it, you can get both B and T cell effect. That's why conjugated vaccine we use. Examples of conjugated vaccine would be uh, hemoplasma influenza type B, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. There's always this uh, thing about these vaccinations. There's this like PPSV and uh, PCV. PCV is generally for uh, 
basically for infants, PPSB for is for the elderly. MCB, you can see it's a it's a meningococcal vaccine. You can remember these things this way, like see that hepatitis B at birth. At two, it's BD, it's BDR hip. It's just DR hip. Then it's again BDR hip. Then it's mad HPV one one to one point five and four six. Four to six years, it's very lean. And then it's Tada human men. Then it's just men. Then it's meningococcal booster dose. Tada is like you see like T tap and D tap. There has been a lot of confusion. D tap means what? Diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular cortices. And it's given less than seven years of age. This one is given more than seven years of age. This is for basically for the elderly who who has never been immunized before. They start immunizing right now. They will be given this. Then if you need the booster doses, the booster doses would be just T and D. You don't need to give like a lot of hard doses for that. And basically, like the diphtheria toxoid, it is more in this case here. I mean, whereas like in the Elderly, like the T dam, the diphtheria is less, that's why, like, it's small, like small D here. And hepatitis A virus, you give it 1 to 1.5 year. Um, you gain like, the varicella virus vaccination in like 4 to 6 years. DIM, they have talked here about, which is kind of like this uh, inactivated polio vaccine. They don't give like the oral polio vaccine. Bangladesh, uh, like generally, oral polio vaccine is given, but basically they have seen that like oral polio vaccine is associated with paralytic poliomyelitis, so it's no longer offered in the United States. Uh, generally, they give this IPV, like inactivated polio vaccine. And there is like a lot of notes and stuff here. We look at you. MMR vaccine is also given. You see one to one in five. After five years, measles, mumps, rubella, they are talked here about. So, you need to know about this uh, vaccination schedule. Sometimes, and some random questions might pop up in the exam. For this question, like it's like some fetish uh, NDME is having nowadays. Like, they are having questions like for intention to treat in quite like every NDMEs. So it's generally nothing, it's a very simple thing. Uh, here, like they have said, like a prospective study is done to assess the related efficacy of two different antihypertensive medications, and both of which were shown to be efficacious in placebo controlled trials. In the study, patients with hypertension with ran were randomly assigned to receive one of the two antihypertensive medications. At the conclusion of the study, some participants reported inconsistent adherence to their medication. Wherever there is a adherence problem, remember it for your assembly purpose, it's going to be intention to treat analysis. But others reported discontinuing their study medication altogether before the primary outcome. A few of these patients who could discontinue their study medication were prescribed the other group's study medication by their primary care physician and were taking it at the time of the primary outcome measurement. In the primary analysis, which of the following methods should the investigators use to analyze data for the patients who were not adhered to the medication regimen? Uh, basically, like if, whenever you're doing some kind of randomized controlled trial, you you can like choose people. You can choose like you have to like choose people randomly, and the, the two groups like which one would be controlled, another would be like intervention group. And in the control and intervention group, they should be quite like similar and equal in size, equal in number of aspects, and you can control the confoundings in case of randomized controlled trial. But here in this case, what we are seeing is like uh, we need to remember always like before a clinical trial or trial, whatever you say, you need to keep like an accountability of everything that is happening. I mean, how many people got enrolled there, how many people left it, how many people got adhered to the treatment regimen, how many people adhered to the intervention, how many control left it, and how many withdrew from the entire thing. You need to specify these things completely before the board uh, of the trial or the jury of the trial so that your trial cannot come, I mean, it doesn't become futile. 
because if you if you give like complete specifications of everything that has happened throughout the process then it then you can basically like find out like what is the problem and it doesn't overestimate or it doesn't uh, I mean underestimate the entire findings of the study and that's that's what it's called a second so yeah it doesn't overestimate or underestimate anything so that's how like it's uh, dealt with and that's that's the entire theme of intent to treat analysis you have to have like a complete thing uh, I mean complete uh, data gathering of everything that have happened here and this one is an example you can see like we have put up everything like how many were excluded because why they were excluded because they did not meet the inclusion criteria and they declined some people declined to participate there were some other reasons and this is important like you cannot just say like okay like I included this 285 uh, two were not there okay fine we won't count them no it's not like this you have to include the outcome for each participant in the group to which he or she was randomized. This is how like studies are done in randomized control trial and this is this even small detail is very important. It can change out the entire prospect or you can say like the entire result of the study. So here the answer would be C. This question it's pretty easy. We have asked about a 65-year-old man scheduled for physical therapy three days following a right shoulder operation as part of a regimen to strengthen his right rotator cuff muscle. He began therapy to strengthen the subscapularis muscle. So it's talking about subscapularis and you need to know like what subscapularis does. See here the muscles we know like for like the rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus they have. Uh, there is teres minor and there is uh, subscapularis which is on the other side. Basically, subscapular is C coming from the posterior side, not posterior, basically that one is the anterior side of the scapula, which we cannot see. It's basically the shoulder blades, inside part of the shoulder blades. That's where it's coming from and it's uh, adhering here, like, to this part. Now, you can see, like, the rotation they does, or, like, the function they have, basically, as part of the rotator cuff, they all helps to abduct or adduct or rotate the arm but each has specific functions like let's suppose supraspinatus is used for abduction which clearly makes sense if it contracts it will be abducted infraspinatus uh, this one also makes sense it would cause like lateral rotation and there would be abduction in that case uh, there wouldn't be any abduction sorry in teres minor see it would cause like lateral rotation there would be adduction subscapularis is different it causes medial rotation there's another muscle that also causes medial rotation and that one is teres major remember it also causes medial rotation as well as adduction and we remember it this way six subscapularis infraspinatus teres minor and subscapularis supraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve as well as infraspinatus by the suprascapular nerve. Teres minor is by the axillary nerve and subscapularis is by the upper and the lower subscapular nerves. Uh, supraspinatus, uh, supraspinatus injury can happen. It's very common. Tendinopathy of tear can be assessed by using this empty CAN test, which is very, very important. I have seen a lot of questions coming into the NBMEs as well as in the UR. So you need to remember this thing. This is very important. Mm, infraspinatus happens during pitching injury, uh, teres minor and subscapularis, we have seen it already. Uh, they are innervated primarily by the C5 to C6 section of the spinal cord. And supraspinatus C, like on the greater tubercle, infraspinatus as well. Teres minor is on the uh, lateral side of the greater tubercle and lesser tubercle only one muscle attaches and that is subscapularis to the lesser tubercle. Very, very, very important. Uh, arm abduction 0 to 15 degrees remember it's supraspinatus then after 15 to 100 it's deltoid the entire thing greater than 90 it would be the accessory muscles as well that would work the one that innervates the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid 
and greater than 100, it will be the serratus anterior, which comes beneath on the, uh, it would come like from the lateral side of the subscapularis muscle, the lateral border of the ventral surface of the scapula. The next question is like a 61 year old man is prescribed fluoxetine for major depressive disorder. This drug has its initial effect on neurons arising of which of the following structures? So this one is a pretty easy question. Fluoxetine which is like an SSRI, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So if you use them, uh, it, it, and we're just seeing it by the drug itself, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That means like serotonin wouldn't be taken up by the cell and it would stay more on the neurons on the synaptic cleft and it would have its effect and basically serotonin is released from the raffi nucleus and that's what they are asking for and we have seen a question there like in the um, initial sections of our question solving today easy question next question is a 50 year old man who lives in eastern minnesota comes to the physician in july because of a three-day history of fever in the knees temperature is 39.4 pulse is 84 respirations of 14 blood pressure is 100 by 70 physical examination shows no abnormalities laboratory studies show a hemoglobin concentration of 13.6 leukocyte count of 3500 platelet count of 90,000. the result of pcr for anaplasma is positive uh, positive organism in this patient is transmitted by a vector at which of the following pairs of pathogen. So they are asking about like this anaplasma. It is basically like uh, the vector for anaplasma is basically a vector for another organism as well, or like for a pair of organism. So which one is the pair? And basically, like the vector is like this thing, deer tick. You remember it? known as deer tick which is known as like the axodus tick and this deer tick this one like Babesia, Borrelia they are also carried by the same vector so basically it's deer tick it's gonna be A that is the answer basically Okay, so the next question, we are seeing a child with septicemia has antibiotic clearance. So, steady state concentration of the antibiotic is 12, which of the following is the maintenance dose? So, we need to remember this maintenance dose. It's basically like this. If you give it once a day, every 24 hours, you have to give it, you should take into consideration the clearance you have to take the steady state concentration as well as you should take like the dosing interval which is the tau and you should take into the consideration the bioavailability which is IV which is equal to 1 in this case and ultimately like if you take this 0.09 they have been doing a trick here if you take it somewhat like this 0 0.1 the answer will turn out to be 28.8 that is the answer this tau you would think it as like it would take you take it as one because you're giving it once per 24 hour so yeah then a 63 year old man comes to the physician because of a two month history of progressive shortness of breath with exertion Pulse is 80, respirations are 8, blood pressure is 125 by 80, physical examination shows no other abnormalities. A chest x-ray shows a mass presenting against the outside of the trachea just above the carina. Now if you have mass 
pressing gauge outside of the trachea just above you know okay this thing above the carina if you see the problem is basically like it's a thoracic compression it's kind of like you cannot take in much oxygen you cannot let out too much oxygen which is kind of an obstructive disease itself and in obstructive disease we know what happens the FVC forced vital capacity uh, it would be basically decreased FEV1 is to FVC that would be decreased as well and the peak expiratory flow rate well that would be decreased as well inspiratory flow rate that would be decreased as well because it's all way a problem it's it's kind of like an obstructive disease but in obstructive disease you don't have inspiratory flow problem but here you would have because you have a mass of obstructing outside of the trachea so here the answer would be C. this is an easy question if you have ever seen this 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 picture wasn't given here but they have said like there is a ichi rash uh, and uh, she working in an animal clinic uh, scratched on both arms while caring for litter of kittens and shows annular erythematous plaques with central clearing as well as advancing scaly borders there is no regional lymphadenopathy that excludes cat scratch which of the following is most likely diagnosis no regional lymphadenopathy mycobacteria excluded somehow psoriasis yeah it can happen toxoplasmosis very unlikely very very unlikely there is no such vignette given uh, psoriasis is like yeah it can have something like this but it would be like more scaly it wouldn't be like this central clearing what we are seeing out here only thing that uh, fits here is tinea purpuris which is like Mm, it's like it's like a tinea infection can uh, like yeah it's a tinea infection of the trunk and it's pretty common after like uh, exposure to litters of kittens or like handling of animals it's pretty common and what would be the treatment treatment would be like you can give it traconazole you can give fluconazole uh, but generally fluconazole is not given it traconazole is the treatment of choice as well as tarbinafin can also be tried in this case so it can be itraconazole remember this next question we're moving into a 48 year old man comes to the physician because of a 24 hour history of severe abdominal pain and blood tinged vomiting, smokes 2 packs of cigarette, drinks 8, 12 ounce cans of beer daily, temperature is 37.7, pulse is 110, respirations are 16, blood pressure is 120 by 90, abdominal examination shows absence of bowel sounds, involuntary guarding, epigastric tenderness, rebound tenderness, everything they're saying out here is like classic for peritonitis if you have seen patients of peritonitis you would know it right away so yeah a few things come handy when you have good experience if you're really experienced if you have studied a lot a lot of things would come handy but yeah it's really difficult to accumulate such a huge amount of knowledge in this small time because you cannot take forever to give an exam if you are somebody so this one the answer it would be like perforated peptic ulcer there is nothing to think like cholecystitis yeah it can cause technically but unlikely in this case because um, you can see like all the vignettes are given out here like smoking then alcoholism everything that can cause perforated peptic ulcer is given and there is pneumoperitoneum you can see this thing here air under the diaphragm this is new pneumoperitoneum that's so annoying writing with this
Let's move on to the next question. 45 year old man is brought to the emergency department after being found unconscious in the desert 24 hours ago, hiking and lost consciousness after falling and striking his head on a rock. Pulse is 124, blood pressure is 80 by 40, mildly confused, multiple echinosis, a large contusion in the left forehead. Best explains the hypotension. Now, this hypotension, you have to remember, it caused a lot of confusion to a lot of people I've seen. Uh, basically, like you have hypotension, that means you have a whole lot of blood being lost. Anaphylaxis doesn't fit here. Hypothermia doesn't fit. Hypovolemic shock, yeah, it does fit. This is the answer. Why? You have a lot of blood loss. The blood pressure is really low. Increased ICP, which you would be seeing in neurogenic shock. You would have had like bradycardia in this case. In ICP, there would be like decreased heart rate. You know the pushing reflex. In the Cushing reflex, there is bradycardia, and uh, there would be like a lot of other problems as well. Like uh, there would be bradycardia, you would have like hypertension, stuff like this. It's really a problem. Myocardial infarction it doesn't make sense. It's not the answer. This question, 21 year old man comes to the physician because of a one month history of fever and abdominal pain, also has had a 6.8 kg weight loss during this period. He's, consul he's a consultant to NGO that supports organic farming. He returned from a two month trip to the Middle East three weeks ago. Temperature is 39.8. Physical examination shows generalized lymphadenopathy and hyperosplenomegaly. There is pancytopenia. Everything you are seeing here, weight loss, there is Middle East, there is temperature, and there is support organic farming, like it's associated with cattle and organic farming basically. This thing is all like related to Kalazar, and this Kalazar is basically, I was saying in Bihar, state of India, there is like a lot of Kalazar cases because a lot of people stay close to like this cattle, I mean, this places where cattle breed. And since like the uh, socio-economic condition out there is not that good because it's one of the poorest states in India. So it's like a public health problem for the entire country of India. So the answer would be Lishmania, that's it. Lishmania Dongwani is the one that causes the uh, Lishmaniasis, a visceral Lishmaniasis is colors and, and the cutaneous one is PKT. We have said a 21 year old man is brought to the emergency department 30 minutes after sustaining knife wounds to the abdomen in a gang related fight. He is in shock, undergoes immediate operative repair of a perforation of the small intestine and a bleeding puncture wound to the liver. Recovery is uneventful and the patient is discharged. Six months later, he is admitted to the hospital for treatment of an intestinal obstruction caused by peritoneal adhesions. During the corrective abdominal operation, it is observed that one of the sides of the previous injury has regenerated without any evidence of fibrous scarring. So there is regeneration and there is no evidence of fibrous scarring. Which of the following sides? Out of all this, you can think about it, only liver does this kind of regeneration. Small intestine can also do, but there would be fibrosis. Skin, it's full of fibrosis and granulation tissue, skeletal muscle atrophied. If you work out, it can get hypertrophic, but it's not that kind of easy. There will be a lot of fibrosis, adipose subcutaneous tissue. There will be granulation tissue and fibrosis up there as well. Liver is the one, remember, that stays in the G0 phase. If you remember biochemistry, like it was. It's with the cell cycle thing, if you remember it properly.
feed this thing and find it out up here. Okay, basically it was in the markup section somewhere. So basically you see like the permanent cells are like the neurons, skeletal, cardiac muscle and RBCs, they don't regenerate at all. A hepatocytes, lymphocytes, proximal convoluted cells and uh, periosteal cells, they enter the G1 from G0 when stimulated, when required they will divide, hepatocytes are amongst them, the lymphocytes also does divide, proximal convoluted tubules also divide as well as the periosteal cells, whenever there is breakage in the bone or like whatever the problem in the bone, it always is regenerating as well as it's scalloping off the osteoblasts. It's like a marvel of science, like osteoblast and osteoblast are working in kind of like a consorted fashion. Liver cells is like bone marrow, gut epithelium, skin, hair follicles and the germ cells. And it's the same question, the last one would be like male pattern blindness. They were asking about like a 40 year old man who came for routine health maintenance examination. His active lifestyle that includes swimming and cycling. Physical examination has no abnormalities. Professional image is, is affected. So he wants to like have like some good treatment option. And the answer should be finasteride, not for none of them makes sense because finasteride would help like would decrease like the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and there will be less conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone is actually responsible for male pattern baldness and if you have more testosterone that would help you with uh, having more of like good hairs or hair fall would decrease. And there was a question, ligation of blood supply to the spleen, spleen most likely damaged, uh, which are the following additional structures, the spleen ligation, if you ligate the blood supply to the spleen, uh, which one would be damaged they were talking about. So only one is like the spleno-renal ligament where the tail of the pancreas lies and that should be the answer, the answer should be E. So today up to this, I uh, hope I'll come back again and I will try to solve more and more questions. Uh, it was fun today doing a lot of question solving. I don't know if I'll be or if I have come to use to any of you guys. But yeah, basically I'm, I'm also practicing myself and I'm trying to do like some kind of video out of it so that well, if required, I will be able to revise them. As well as if somebody finds out, finds this thing interesting, or they have any queries or anything, they can message me always on the comment section or anywhere. I try to give like a reasonable amount of explanation if possible. Thank you. Peace off today. Okay, so I'm signing off today, see you again.